Okay. All right. All right. So I guess uh, we'll call the meeting to order. It's uh, 7.01. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, we are very excited to be here, Community Board 8 of the Borough of the Bronx, at a joint meeting of two committees, Parks and Recreation and Environment and Sanitation. My name is Camelia Tepelus. I'm the chair for Environment and Sanitation Committee, and I'm here in the office with several uh, committee members and board members, and uh, hosting along with uh, Deb Travis. Deb, you wanna say something? <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm Deb Travis. I'm the chair of the Parks Committee um, for Bronx Community Board 8. Um, Camelia, would you like me to go into my the housekeeping of just how we'll run the meeting? Does that work? Sure, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. So, um, you know, as a community board committee, we loosely follow Robert's rules of order. We will be following the agenda that was previously distributed. If we open a topic to general discussion, we ask that if you would like to speak, that you raise your hand and either I or Camelia will call on you. Our goal is to have a good, robust discussion and um, of the whole of the all of the agenda items. But if time it gets limited, you um, and we have many people who would like to speak, you may only get to speak once. So um, just make sure to make it count um, get all, and say everything you need to say. Um, let's see, if, uh, if you're not speaking, we ask that you keep yourself muted to prevent background noise from interrupting other people. If you're on Zoom to raise your hand, uh, you will select reactions at the bottom of the screen. If you're on the phone, it is star six to mute and unmute and star nine to raise and lower your hand. Um, and then uh, I think we will next, we'll go into just a roll call of the Parks Committee. Um, Bob Bender. Yep. David Gelman. Present. Uh, uh, Rob, I see your hand is raised. I'll finish the roll call and I'll come right back to you. Um, uh, Rob Jaklowski. All right. Uh, I know Ramdat is not going to be attending this evening. Uh, Leona Tetton. Is it? <laughs> Sorry, present. <laughs> Hi, Leona. Uh, and Scott Kroppinger. Uh, Scott, are you there? All right. And then uh, Rob, your hand is raised. Deb Scott is not on the parks uh, after he became treasurer. Oh, that's right. Okay, thank you. I'll okay. That. Good call, thank you. Didn't, didn't Bob Panuzzi join at that point? And Bob Panuzzi, yes. I gotta update my list. Um, and I see Bob is already here, so that's good. Um, Rob, you're muted. Uh, I thought I unmuted myself. No, we can... Oh, there you go. Okay, my question is, I thought that this was a committee uh, meeting, joint committee meeting, and not a public hearing. So therefore, uh, the discussions would be among the committee members. And after the committee members have finished discussing things, then usually board members get to speak, and then the public gets to make comments. But it isn't a public hearing where we're taking input. At, at least that's my understanding. That so, it, it, yeah, so it's not, a, it's not a public hearing. This is a joint meeting. Regions of public, but not engaging with the public in terms of what's going to be the end product of our resolution, unless somebody says something that we think is a great idea. Yeah, um, no, um, so I, I, I think I can, I can clarify, like the, it, this is a joint meeting of um, a committee meeting. So the, what you can expect is that the, they'll make their presentation, the DD, uh, DDC, DEP and parks will make their presentation on Tibbetts Brook. Um, the committee will be open to questions. The board will be open to questions. We'll then open it up to the public to any questions that they have. And then we'll pull it back in for the committee to have a discussion of the resolution and what we would like to do as a, as a follow on. Does that make sense, Rob? Okay. Um, Camelia, do you uh, have anything you want to add or should we, um, you, you want to go right into attendance for your committee? I think I have to confirm correct, yes. So for ENS, um, let's do roll call. Uh, Camelia Tepelus here. Uh, Bob Panuzzi, our vice chair, is here for the record. Here. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, Deb Travis? Here. Rashida Hilliard? Present. Karen Argenti? Present. And Bob Spouter? Present. Thank you very much, Bob. And please put your hand down because you're confusing us. <laughs> I mean, unless there's something else, thank you so much. And uh, also just wanted to add to, uh, as to what Deb said as far as 
procedure. Um, if any elected uh, uh, representatives, offices, staff members, etc., are here, kindly um, raise your hands and, and introduce yourself at this moment if you are here. But if we see them later, let's kind of give them priority them in terms of uh, you know them having statements, etc., on the topic. Uh, so. Quorum is confirmed on both committees. I'm moving into the um, approval of the committee minutes for ENS. Oh. They were circulated by, yeah? One question, uh, one, uh, one thing before yep. Camelia is, um, are there any community board members on the call? We have two uh, other categories they of people are. we just wanna note. Um, we've got Loris Balter, I saw. Any, anybody else? I think I saw Bob uh, Robert Jakowski just joining. Uh, yeah, like that's, a minute ago. yeah. Oh, Rob's here. Okay, great. Yeah, hey, Rob. Yeah, he's on Thank the Parks you. Committee. Uh, any other board members? And are there any elected officials or representatives from elected offices? And then, are there any represent representatives from agencies here? A plenty. Not yeah, there's lots of them. There's all, so but let's, are there, is, yeah. other than the two, other than the presenters, I would say, are there, are there anybody else who's from an agency? Uh, yeah, yeah, John, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, uh, good evening, Deb. It's Carl from Partnerships for Parks. Great, thanks. Hey, Carl. Uh, how are you? Good. John uh, McLaughlin, uh, New York City DEP. Great. Hi, John. Hey, good evening. Anybody else who is not a presenter? Okay, and so then um, I, I guess uh, while I've got the floor, uh, I'll do the um, the approval of the parks minutes. Um, the the parks minutes of April 26, 2023 were distributed previously. Um, does anybody on the committee have any changes they would like to make? Is anybody um, opposed to um, present um, to approving the minutes um, as as they currently exist? Yeah. Um, anybody abstaining? All right. So I move that the I deem the minutes to be unanimously approved and hand it back to Camilla. All right. Uh, same procedure for ENS uh, minutes were circulated by the office May fifth, ten a.m. Um, any one of the ENS uh, members having any comments or um, other edits? If not, I would like for a motion um, for the approval of the minutes, please. I move we approve the minutes. I second it. And seconded by Karen. Um, anybody abstaining? Anybody against? Minutes of ENS uh, of April 19 deemed approved, and we are ready to move to agenda item number four, which is the New York City DP and DPR presentation on the Tibet's Brook Daylighting and Putnam Greenway project. Um, Pinar, would you advise me who I should make co host at this point in terms of a person on your end? Um, Yes, um, the PowerPoint be, presentation, and then you take it over from there. Yes, um, I think it's going to be Ankita. Is she on it? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Uh, hold on, hold on, Ankita. Okay, Ankita, give me just one second to find you here on my list. Ankita, I found you. All right. My co-host. All right. All right, are you all we seeing see my screen? screen? Yep. yep. All right. Yep, um, great. Everybody can see it. Awesome. All right. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you all for hosting us today. It's going to be a lively meeting. Um, and I would like to kick it off by acknowledging our team members. Um, I'm here to be today accompanied by our consultants, um, Hazen and Sawyer and Star Whitehouse, but also uh, Parks Department. Um, I believe Mitch uh, Loring, Merritt Larson, Stephanie Eric, and John Paul are on the call. I hope I'm not missing anyone else. And from us, from DEP, uh, we have Tara Deegan, John McLaughlin, Amy Moxie, and Effie are on the call today. So it's a full team. 
and we are happy to answer the questions that you may have. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to be going over some of the standard slides that we have seen before, um, talking about the project location. And Ankita, if you can start moving it um, to the next slide. So everybody is now where we are, right? Um, the project location, the site is the known, um, you know, continuation of the old Putnam Trail um, that includes the part in the Van Cortlandt Park, what we also are acquiring in the process of acquiring the CSX property from the Van Cortlandt Park South all the way to 230th Street. That's where it's going to be our new daylighted stream and the Greenway. And then um, the rest is the MTA property that we are going to be talking about how we are handling the, the flows and, um, and the connection over there. But ultimately, we are connecting back to the Harlem River downstream of our regulator and where we will be discharging this new daylighted flow back to the river itself to be able to now connect that hydraulic connection to the old brook. The next slide, please. Um, so we've been together for some time now. I mean, it's, I cannot believe the time flies, but when I look at my calendar, I, I realize that we did indeed working with you all since 2021 winter. And I know um, we've been having a lot of great discussions, meetings, you know, we have held our recent meeting very recently in April, um, our TAC meeting number five, on um, which we provided overall project update and you ask us, you know, come back to the community board and give us more details on the material on more design specific, which we are happy to be giving you those details today. And we have held a great walkthrough first time on the CSX property. We were there, it wasn't a great day, but it was a very well attended event. And thank you for being us. Hopefully we repeat that exercise sometime soon before we kick off the construction um, on the property. Mm -hmm. But we are running, right? We are running and we are so happy to work with you this closely over this run. Um, but you, if you look at our schedule, um, there's some upcoming dates um, you know, pretty fast approaching. The next meeting is going to be our PDC with preliminary design. And we are targeting to complete the design of the project by end of the year. So we can meet the start of the construction in 2025. And one good news that I want to give you today is we did um, award it the construction management contract, which um, the company um, Jacobs, um, is going to be helping us on the construction management of the, the, the project. And we want to bring them on board early enough to give us ideas before we actually put the bid package together so that we are checking everything um, we, we, you know, before we re release that bid package. So that was a great accomplishment. And I want to really thank our team here um, who made that um, happen along the way. So moving to the next slide um, is the you know, our traditional slide where it shows who owns what along this um, greenway and the new parkland. Um, you know, the green line here, as you all know, where we are daylighting the Tibbet uh, and due to the circumstances and the constraints, which we are gonna do, go die deep today, tonight, we are indeed um, bringing that daylighting to a closed circuit or closed pipe around 232nd Street. So we are going under blow ground and then going all the way to the metro lot property and discharging um, to the Harlem River. So we'll be going over some of these, um, you know, reasons why we made this choice um, and what is what are the driving forces along the different parts of the trail. Um, you all know the, the great benefits of this project, you know, um, the CSO reduction is what, where my group is leading. Uh, we are going to be reducing um, around 25% of the total CSO going into the Harlem River with this project alone. And the cost of this project per gallon um, is around $1. So it's going to be one of our most cost-effective CSO reduction projects, which we are happy to announce. Um, but also, you know, we are working with the Parks Department because it's an important and long-weighted on Greenway Connection Project from the Van Cortland Park to the um, west of the 230th Street. Uh, one thing that we've been highlighting over and over again, it is not a flood protection or flood mitigation project. Um, so I wanna again 
highlighted here, uh, we are going to be maximizing the wet weather flow up to 38 CFS and providing the full protection from the five-year storm. But either like storm, right, it's still going to keep causing the flooding in this, in this um, greenway in the upcoming years. But the conditions are going to be a little bit more improved compared to today's. Um, so current project status is funding in place, 133 million. We secured the funding. Hopefully we'll stay below those limits, um, striving for that. And um, the construction drawings, which we have the preliminary construction drawings are currently under the agency reviews. The next one, please. Uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention about our, um, you know, forgotten, um, or, you know, you, you probably remember, but today we are not really detailing that um, John McLaughlin worked really hard with you all on the Hester and Piero's Mill Pond improvements um, with, with our partner, Stephanie John Paul. This um, first phase of this project, the lake are indeed happening this year. We awarded the contract, construction contract, it's going to be starting um, sometime late summer, early fall. So we are actually deciding to start construction um, or, you know, by the end of this year to make these improvements. And um, the next one, I think I have a couple more slides. So this is, you know, the goals that I already summarized for you, um, which you are familiar with the CSO benefits, so on and so forth. So if we can skip this one, thank you. And then the next one. Um, so this is where we are um, in terms of the pu public access points, and we label these access points for you um, for an easy reference, but it, it, this is a great graphic that really summarizes where are the vehicular access points, which we got great input from MIPD, um, fire department, um, and that's incorporated here, and where are the pedestrian and bike access points, and there is this one feature access point, as you all know. Um, it's still contingent on the ongoing coordination with the private property owner along the 236th Street. Um, so we are going to go going to uh, dive deep into those design evolution and what we have done. Um, again, I want to acknowledge you all. We took all your feedback the last five TAC meetings um, and made those modifications, which we hope to share with you today. But it's really, you know, improved connectivity. We are looking at this maintenance and access issues very um, in a more informed um, path with the slopes, entrances, the fencing, which we are going to be sharing. Most importantly, the project design has evolved greatly. And I think Ankita is going to give you the great news on that one. Um, stormwater design, uh, we have done some shifts in terms of the intake structure in order to, to allow for better management of the stormwater from the lowest lying properties. As you all know, there are several of those properties in the low lying areas that um, have been complaining about flooding. So uh, to be accommodating that condition and not to make it worse, we had to shift the intake structure, which is um, more north along to 232nd Street, and we'll be going over that um, details today. And finally, the stream access had been um, a lot of feedback that we realized that, um, you know, that is important for the community. So we have incorporated quite a lot of improvements and um, also access points for the community where those overlook areas can exist. Last not the least, we are also going to talk about the art, where the art could, um, you know, um, be better placed in this corridor. And I think Ankita is going to go over some of those key points in the upcoming slides. So not made, I'm taking too much time. I'm rushing and I want to really give the floor to Ankita um, so she can go over these details with you all. Thank you, Binar. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Ankita Gupta with Star White House Landscape Architects. Um, so uh, as Pinar mentioned, we did look at the design in a lot of detail since the last time we met. Uh, and we developed the overall plan holistically, keeping in mind the natural diverse character of Van Cotten Park, as well as uh, the narrow width of the CSX uh, corridor. 
so just in terms of the material design considerations, uh, as Pinar mentioned, we looked at the maintenance of the corridor, the durability, all the agency and bikeway standards, safety and user experience. So as she mentioned, we uh, did closely coordinate with FDNY, NYPD, uh, just to make sure that the vehicles can get in to the greenway and out. Uh, the aesthetics, as well as the ecological value uh, for the project. Um, and then based on that, we developed our materials kit of parts. Um, so just looking at pavements, site furnishings, edges, signage, and planting. Uh, and really our goal here is to create an identity for this project, intuitive wayfinding, provide better connectivity for both pedestrians, bike, bicyclists, as well as for maintenance vehicles, uh, site security, as well as habitat enhancement for the whole project. Um, so looking at Van Cortlandt Park, uh, the, the character of the design in this uh, section of the project is intended to bridge the trail and the corridor experience with the park ecology, the existing wetlands, as well as the woodlands. Um, and what we really try to do is, even though the Van Cortlandt Park section as well as the CSX corridor are very distinct in their character, we try to create a palette which can intersect between the two sections. So we've tried to carry a few materials across as well as there are some distinct materials. So in terms of pavements, we will be using asphalt for the existing parking lot in Van Cortlandt Park. The trails will be porous asphalt. We will be using stabilized screenings at uh, the Hester uh, Pond. Um, there will be hex pavers at uh, access point entrances, as well as stone steps, which I'll show as we go into uh, the plan enlargements. Um, in terms of fences and gates, we will be using four feet high steel picket fence and gates. Um, at the Weir uh, Dam, we will be using the fence to mimic uh, what exists over there currently. Um, and then in terms of furnishings, the uh, trash receptacle, world's fair bench and bike racks are uh, to match what exists in the park currently. Um, and then same for lighting, we will be using the Riverside Luminaire painted steel black, which uh, is currently there in the park. Um, so starting with the Hester and Piero's mill pond area, uh, this is um, an important starting point in the project. This is where the water moves from the sewer to the newly created daylighted stream. Uh, we have created overlooks at this point um, to allow for people to get closer to the water. So we have seating as well as platforms to allow for these viewing uh, decks. Uh, this path will be repaved uh, with compacted crushed stone, um, keeping in mind the naturalistic nature of the park as well as the historic structure of the dam. Um, I'm gonna hand it over quickly to uh, Dahlia to uh, talk a little bit about the stream channel design. Thank you, Ankita, um, and thanks all for having us. Um, in the stream channel design uh, within the Van Cortlandt Park, we are creating a pool and riffle structure uh, type of, uh, of stream where we are taking advantage of some of the space that's available uh, adjacent to the existing Tibbetts wetland um, and uh, will be below adjacent to uh, the parking lot area and uh, meandering the stream. It's uh, going to mimic a uh, type C stream for those who are familiar with um, stream morphology, but it's really going to be a shallow, uh, you know, slow moving stream uh, low gradient uh, because there is not a lot of slope within this area and uh, allowing us to do a lot of nice plantings along the edge and create a more naturalistic uh, stream corridor. And Kita, I think you can go on. Yep. Uh, so here we are looking at Van Cortlandt Park 
north, uh, we can look at uh, here, uh, we can see the proposed daylighted channel in relation to the Putnam. I'm sorry. Can Hold on, hold on now. If somebody somebody is unmuted, kindly mm -hmm. mute yourself. It's okay now. Proceed, please proceed, Dalia okay. or Ankita. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so the Putnam Trail here is in relationship to the newly daylighted uh, stream. Uh, we will be using porous asphalt at the new uh, proposed uh, trail. Uh, and the parking lot here that you see, which is existing, will be repaved. Um, moving to Van Cortlandt Park South, there are two bridges, pedestrian bridges that are being proposed. Uh, the bridge that you see here to the right um, ties in with the east-west park circulation, as well as to the west 242nd Street park entrance. Uh, there will be to uh, trailheads uh, uh, connecting to the existing parking lot. So one is here in line with the pedestrian bridge and the one to the south uh, does allow for an entrance plaza with um, space for benches, bike racks, trash, and this is a controlled access uh, which allows you to connect to the Putnam Trail. Um, there's another bridge over here, which I'll talk on the next slide. Uh, you can see it better over there. Uh, so here, just looking at uh, the bridge, this is a prefabricated uh, bridge, uh, which is gonna be painted steel brown. And then, sorry, uh, this is the other bridge to the south, just looking at it in relation to uh, the Van Cortland Park South Bridge, as well as the uh, Jerome uh, Park Diversion Structure. Uh, this is a um, rendering in the park view node. So that's the proposed bridge, as well as this is the Putnam Trail. Uh, so with that, I'll be moving into the corridor design for uh, CSX uh, section. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the materials, some of the materials carry through um, from the Van Corten Park, and then some of them are more specific to the corridor. So again, here we will be using asphalt or porous asphalt, concrete for the elevated structures, hex pavers uh, at the access point entrances, and then painted warning strips at intersections. Uh, we will be using the same uh, steel picket fence as in Van Cortlandt Park, uh, and then aluminum railings along the elevated concrete uh, pathways uh, in the corridor. Uh, the trash receptacle and bike racks will be the same as the park. Uh, we have a slight variation for the bench. It's gonna be the 1964 World's Fair bench. And then just keeping in mind uh, the, um, Nature of the corridor, we are using a more modern pole, which is a David pole painted steel silver. Um, in terms of lighting the underpasses, we will be using standard DOD fixtures and rearranging them to allow for sufficient lighting under the bridge. Uh, so here we are looking at, uh, this is the transition where the the corridor changes from Van Corten Park to the right to the CSX corridor. Uh, so that's the other bridge that I was referencing earlier. It does um, connect to stone steps um, that are natural stone slabs. Uh, it provides a direct connection to the existing park paths. We also have an ADA accessible ramp that allows you to connect um, at this location. Uh, and then transitioning into the CSX corridor, uh, there is a vehicular uh, a maintenance as well as pedestrian bicyclist uh, access point at 239th Street. Um, the upper level, the, the deep yellow that you see is an entrance plaza with benches, trash receptacles, 
by cracks. Uh, there is an elevated concrete uh, pathway that connects you to the greenway. And here at number four, there is a proposed lookout, which also happens to be the widest section in the CSX corridor. So it does allow uh, to take a pause there uh, for a bicyclist or a pedestrian uh, and look into uh, look at the stream. Uh, here's a view uh, of the 239th Street access point, looking at the lookout, uh, the greenway, as well as the access ramp, uh, access ramp from the upper location. Uh, so here, this is between 238th Street and 236th Street. Uh, this is next to BJ's, which is a large building on the west side. Uh, we have created a planting strip between the path and the building to allow for buffer. Um, and then um, what you see over here is a typical underpass, uh, which I'll talk later could be uh, can be a potential location for art. Uh, looking between 234th and 236th Street, the path here has been elevated uh, to match the elevation for the existing parking lot. And this is where we did talk about a potential access point, um, which is pending coordination with the private landowner. Uh, here's a view looking south, uh, sorry, uh, here's a view looking south with the Major Deegan to the left hand side and the parking lot to the right. Um, another view at 236th Street looking north, uh, the private parking lot is to the left and Major Deegan to the right. Uh, between 233rd Street and 234th Street, uh, we have the entrance uh, access point here at 233rd Street. Uh, this does allow for a more direct connection to the Greenway uh, and allows for more planting. Um, at this location, it also still maintains connectivity to the Bailey Playground, which is to the east side of the Major Deacon. Uh, looking at the section in relation to the access ramp as well as the greenway, and you can see here it overlaps with the stream and allows for enough planting of space in the corridor. Uh, this is um, a section at the underpass which offers a unique place for potential art uh, installation. Uh, so uh, looking at the plan between 231st Street and 233rd Street, um, as Pinar mentioned earlier, now we have our intake structure uh, between this section. Uh, Daria, would you like to talk a little bit uh, about the intake structure location? Sure. Um, as Ankita noted um, uh, and Pinar, we had shifted the intake structure uh, to this location uh, to be able to design around some of the, uh, the lowest line area um, in the corridor. The area you see in dark green is, um, is uh, very low line and there is private property, particularly the property closest to two, West 231st Street, um, where uh, they uh, have a low line area on the private property as well. Um, and the building um, adjacent to that, closer to the intake structure, has uh, low windows. Um, so uh, with those constraints, what we have done is uh, put the stream corridor into a pipe um, upstream of that low-line area, and that gives us more space to be able to, um, to grade uh, a low-line area within the corridor adjacent to those properties um, and an area that's lower than those properties so that we can uh, contain any rainfall that falls within that area within the that wetland area that we are creating. So we're, we're intentionally creating a bioretention area with additional storage underneath to be able to fully contain uh, the rainfall that falls within that low line area and 
uh, reduce any risk associated with uh, the stream overtopping its banks. Nikita? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, going to the next one, which is the last section in the corridor. Uh, so at 238th Street, this is uh, at this location, the start or the end of the public greenway, uh, there is a four feet high steel picket fence with gate here to allow for bicyclists as well as pedestrians to access the greenway. Uh, we have a maintenance path at the lower level uh, to allow for DEP to work on the underground pipe uh, as needed. And there is a control access below, which is a chain link fence. Uh, to allow access uh, into the MTA corridor. Uh, the other access point here is where we're in place, uh, again, both pedestrians, bicyclists, as well as for maintenance vehicles. Uh, we have uh, our plaza over here with benches, trash receptacles, bike racks, et cetera. Uh, there is a tall building over here, so we did pull the path away slightly to allow for a planting buffer, as well as the planting can also help discourage graffiti on the, the facade of the building. Uh, here we're looking at a typical access point entrance. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we have a kit of parts for um, these areas. Uh, in the, this is Edward Whelan. We have a pedestrian gate, Number two indicates a vehicular gate for maintenance vehicles. We have special pavement, hex pavers, um, and then a bench with uh, bike racks and a trash receptacle um, before you connect to the greenway. Uh, this is a rendering uh, from 230th Street looking north. Um, and then in terms of art, we did evaluate for spaces uh, across the project uh, for art and the spaces under bridges are a great opportunity for art and they can become focal points to showcase uh, local artists work. Um, so just looking at a typical um, space under the bridge, uh, the greenway will go adjacent to the potential area. Um, there will be cast in place concrete pavement with um, special scoring patterns. And then uh, this is the potential mural location along uh, the wall. Uh, the project is going to have interpretive signage, standard greenway signage, as well as painted um, stripings and um, across the project. Um, in terms of uh, ecology, uh, we uh, did choose uh, planting that embraces both the microenvironment of Van Corten Park as well as the CSX corridor. Uh, here we are looking at the planting design that embraces microclimate uh, environments for both uh, VCP and CSX. Um, so we have freshwater wetlands. Uh, within Van Corten Park, as well as forested wetlands. And then in the CSX corridors, we're looking at urban upland forests, as well as stormwater tolerant plants. Uh, that is a typical section across Van Cortlin Park, where we can see the stream, as well as the different zones, how they pan out across um, uh, on either side of the stream. Um, so. Zone one is um, plants that are um, in flood zones. We're looking at sedges, grasses, and forbs here. Uh, here we're looking at uh, plants that are uh, can tolerate shade as well as frequent inundation. Uh, zone three is floodplain forests, uh, more um, in line with uh, trees that can adapt in the Van Cortlandt Park environment. Um, and then in the CSX corridor, we're looking at um, a section where the elevated 
had in relation to the open channel and how there's planting on either side of the stream, as well as planted buffers uh, between the um, path and the adjacent buildings. <laughs> And then here we are looking at the corridor, uh, uh, the, the path in relation to uh, the buried channel, as well as like tall plantings against the buildings to avoid graffiti. Uh, and then in the CSX corridors, just looking at shrubs that can compete with invasive species and, uh, allow, uh, and can grow upright to fit in the narrow corridor. And then here we're looking at trees. Again, uh, we have limited planting space in the corridor. So plants that can grow tall provide screening uh, and buffer uh, spaces. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dahlia to go over the FAQs. Thank you, Ankita. So um, we're just gonna go through some of the FAQs that we've been receiving from uh, from uh, folks over the tag and past uh, and the walkthroughs, et cetera. So um, one of the first questions, uh, will there still be a waterfall in Hester and Piero's Mills Pond? Uh, there will be limited flow to the existing weir, which currently is functioning uh, like a visual waterfall uh, because all of the base flow will be going uh, to the new stream corridor. Uh, but that flowing water will be visible in the new stream um, on this, which will be on the south side of the lake path. So we're not going to have a spillway in the park in the lake itself, but we'll see it um, see that water in the stream. Uh, will the new stream support wildlife? Yes, it will. It's going to be a freshwater stream and it will support flora and fauna suitable for this ecosystem. Will this project manage the five-year design storm? Yes, the project will design uh, is designed to convey the five-year design storm, um, and the existing outfall has sufficient capacity uh, to convey this flow. So when we talk about the existing outfall, we're talking about the outfall at the Harlem River, uh, which has sufficient flow for uh, this uh, stream flow, as well as any combined sewer overflow during a five-year event. Uh, the CSO reduction is uh, going to be uh, between 215 and 220 million gallons per year of uh, reduced CSO overflows to the Harlem River, the most effective green infrastructure program uh, project <laughs> in DP's portfolio. Um, and uh, will this project eliminate overtopping at Hester and Piero's Mill Pond? No, this project will not eliminate the overtopping during extreme events due to the very large tributary area upstream of the lake. Uh, we are limited in the amount of flow that we can convey in this corridor because it is narrow and the downstream site constraints. Um, uh, and under the current conditions, uh, the lake does not over um, can contain um, more than the 10 year, 24 hour storm, um, but uh, uh, starts overtopping. It, it, it seems like uh, with larger events um, and our project is going to maintain the same level of service. Go to the next slide. Uh, will a sound barrier be installed along the Major Deegan? Uh, we have been considering multiple factors to optimize the project goals um, and strike a balance between hydrology, ecology, and user experience along this corridor. Um, we have been in discussions with New York State DOT, but at this juncture, it was determined a sound barrier is not required for this project. Um, however, we are trying to maximize the amount of vegetation within this corridor, um, especially along the highway boundary um, and uh, planting uh, where there's a sufficient space, planting a denser woodier vegetation, um, and overall, approximately 50% of the frontage of the, the portion, the CSX corridor, um, will have that denser vegetation along that highway boundary. Uh, would this project be in conflict with extending the Greenway south of West 230th Street? No, our project would not preclude any extension of the Greenway through the Metro North property by others and New York City DOT is currently studying potential routes for future extensions of the 
Greenway. Uh, they are aware, you know, our project is part of that um, uh, Greenway uh, study that they're doing for the Bronx, and they are uh, looking at other alternatives of how to uh, connect this to the larger bike network. What will the pedestrian experience be like along the CSX corridor? Um, due to the limited width available in the CSX corridor, the Greenway will be primarily for active movement and the few places uh, to pull, pull to the side and rest or observe the stream um, will be primarily at the Verveelin Place um, entrance at 239th Street entrance, and then at the top of the intake structure. Um, they, the corridor is gonna have lights, vegetation, locations for that temporary art during the, below the overpasses, um, and uh, the vehicles, but the vehicles on the Major Deacon Expressway are going to be visible and audible from the corridor. And I think that is it for the FAQs that we've tried to uh, summarize uh, based on, on the many comments we've, we've received over the years. Uh, but I think with this, we can open it up to uh, questions. And myself, Ankita, as well as uh, DP and Parks are able to answer those. Thank you very much, Dali, and thank you very much, full team. Um, uh, Deb, would you like uh, sort of, if you and me have immediate questions to address them, and then we will open it up to our committee members to begin with? Oh, yeah, that sounds great. OK, you so want to go? Got or their, uh, somebody can needs go. to mute. I can, I can go. Someone needs to mute. We're hearing somebody, yeah. Um, I, so thank you for this presentation. I really, the attention to detail, being able to actually see some of the textures of the pavers, et cetera, um, is, is really kind of wonderful. Um, I guess my, one of my first questions is, um, right at the beginning, you talk about trail identity um, and trying to define that. What do you mean by trail identity? And, and um, what kind of identity do you say, do you think the trail, just what, what, what it has, what kind of identity are you aiming to have? Akita, do you want some help with that? Yes, go ahead, Ben. Yeah. So I, I think what's important is that, you know, it's within the park and it's within the corridor, but when you're coming from outside from the na neighborhood street or in the park, you need to understand that you're arriving to a place, right? It's it's what is it? So how do you know that you're there? And how can you do that without lots and lots of signage? So the idea was to use this kit of parts across this segment. So you intuitively know you're there, right? So you have the, the rhythm of the lighting, the common pavement um, and the access points um, should feel welcoming so that you're, you're not just going directly from a park path onto, uh, uh, onto, the, onto the Putnam Trail, as you know, uh, cyclists can can go pretty fast, and um, sometimes they travel in packs. So, so we wanted to make sure that th these kind of touch points between the park and the trail, and the neighborhood and the trail, uh, had a had a language that everyone starts to recognize, and that. At the end of the project, you 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 have a sense of the the trail itself has a sense of place that's appropriate kind of within its context and also as as a linear corridor, right? So it's not even just the segment we're doing, but as it goes all the way to the Westchester County border. So really thinking of it as a place as much as it is just a corridor, because I think a lot of people will use it um, for more than just just cycling. We want to make sure that everybody's able to use it, whether it's a wheelchair or a stroller or a, a cyclist, that it, it, it should feel welcoming to everybody. So I, I think that's, I know, I hope that answers your question, but yeah. You know. I, I, I mean, one thing I would add then is that um, I think it could, it doesn't really feel very Bronx to me. Um, it doesn't really feel unique to me. It looks um, very nicely, it's nice, it's professional, it's got a, a clearly the, the hex pavet, uh, pavers and such have an aesthetic to them, but that it looks still pretty cookie cutter, I would say. And that like, I think of like Ewan Park has like little, um, uh, David, what are they? They're like little, are they fish? I'm trying to remember now. Like there's like a little, little things that identify. And then Washington's Walk has a, you know, this wonderful historic plaque that tells the story of Washington's Walk and the independ um, independence. 
um, uh, the the battle that happened there. That there's places within Van Cortland Park, like the 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 with the stones that tell the, the bit of the story of um, Grand Central Station. That right now this just I, I would just as feedback mm -hmm. I'll say that I don't think it um, it's missing some little detail um, that would that should run through it that should kind of tell the story of either you know Tibbetts Brook or our waterways mm -hmm. more broadly but or just the Bronx specifically right and mm -hmm. so that's one piece I would give you right now I, everything is they're all very nice pieces but they look a lot like Henry Hudson uh, Park or at Henry Hudson, uh, Hudson River Park the Greenway there like it, it in, in Manhattan and that that's just it's a different place it's a great place as well um but uh, i that's i think that the bronx is you know it's very special it's got its own kind of rhythm to it it's different and each borough does and that that's one piece of feedback i would give is just to try to try to find some sort of uh, detail to uh, narrow narrow to make this specific greenway um its own thing um uh, one thing i wanted to know about in terms of all the plantings and stuff which is wonderful to see all the green greenery um, with normal capital projects, usually there's a two-year maintenance contract that's done by the outside contractor. Will that also be the expectation here that once all these plantings and stuff are, are in place, that um, the Parks Department has a couple of years of the outside contractor taking care and making sure that all of these plants survive and get established? Uh, I'll jump. Do you want? Okay, go ahead. Well, I'll just jump in, Deb. Hey, it's Mitchell Loring from Parks. I think that hey, that Mitchell. detail is something that we will still need to be working out with DEP because this isn't a standard Parks Capital project where we are, you know, doing a procurement for our own contractor to build this. It is a DEP procurement and contractor process. So um, I know, as Pinar mentioned earlier, the the CM has just been selected and will be onboarded soon. So I think that's a conversation that we can have, Pinar. Anything to add? Yeah, I mean, you know, Mitch, the the, the green infrastructure contracts that we've been um, bidding either through us or through DDC has an 18 month guarantee period um, that covers um, the plant plants establishment periods, which we call it now, you know, because in the past we learned it from Parks Department <laughs> that, yeah. you know, you can't just plant go away and then come back and they are still there right you have to really water them and make sure that they are um taken care of in the early period so so we arranged our contracts to follow this establishment period language that is going to indeed allow us and monitor the contractor to make sure the plantings are there and thriving and when we transition it from a contractor to an owner, um, the plants are, you know, still in, in good place and good health. So I think we will match, um, you're right, we haven't had that discussion, but I'm hoping, you know, some of that contract language, we can adopt it here that really fits uh, what you may be thinking. Okay, and then am I right to get that? I, I, I think this is what you've said previously, but I wanna make sure that I understand it clearly that this greenway won't be interjurisdictional where parts of it will be DEPs and parts of it will be parks, but the whole thing, including the maintenance of the, the, um, the daylighted brook will also be a part, will be parks land, correct? It, it will all be parkland, but the EP and parks will have a maintenance agreement for right. the pieces, particularly of the water infrastructure that DEP will be responsible for maintaining. Got it. Okay, so there'll be an MOU for it just for like the pipe entrances and the, the, the stuff like that. Right. Got it. Okay. Um, I think those are my those were my main questions. I'm going to hand it back to Camelia for her questions. I'm sure she's got some. Yes, thank you. I just want to just respond really quickly. I think I think your your insights are, are really good, Deborah, and I and we'll take them to heart. I, I agree that it is different, and I think you know, one place is all of those under bridge areas. If there could be, you know, the story could repeat under in those areas. I think that is one area and we didn't mention it, but we are keeping the 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 rail structure in the in Van Cortland Park where there's that that relic of the station. So I think there will there are things there that maybe, you know, it, it's hard to see in the plans, but I I, I think your point is really important and um, 
you know, we'll, we'll keep that in mind as we develop it in more detail, but I think th that was a really um, insightful comment. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, I will have I will I have three fairly narrow points to to make. First, I uh, just want to back up on on, on Deb's sort of um, point on the story, right? I mean, we have so much like wall space. It would be so easy to just put this interpretive like large panels with like showing the map of Tibet's brook back in, I don't know, 1910 or whatever. You see what I mean? So that people understand how this was a meandering body of water, the story and now how it is highlighted and even explaining kind of the technical background of what happened here, essentially, what is happening here. And um, uh, my points are the following. Number one, I saw the answer on the FAQ question regarding the sound. However, this is a very very, very impactful element of this project as we were walking there literally it gives you headaches so I just want to put a plug here and a recommendation as far as even piloting at strategic sites under the overpasses where people naturally tend to linger a little bit and take a moment or two to enjoy the art or whatever will be set up there to have even partial phonic isolation around the underpass overpass under the overpass area and, and explore those type of options. Number two, um, some of the slides where you refer to asphalt, it was either or, or it says the word or asphalt, like regular or porous. So if you could comment on how would that decision sort of be made, obviously we would like as much as possible to have porous surfaces to maximize the absorption capacity. And point number three, there was a slide or two where there, was the, the, there were those sort of high tilts, basically the path was fairly high, but also it looked very narrow. Even in your rendering, there were like two people standing next to each other. So I was wondering, oh my God, what if one of them is pushing a wheelchair and then there's a bike and then there's a family with six children? You see what I'm saying? So, so how that narrowness element, yeah, not this one, I mean. I mean one where the, it was like a section, right? It was tilts, low tilts and then high tilts. So, so Pinar or Dalia or somebody, if you could, exactly there. You see the one at the right, for example? I don't know. I'm just asking about the mixing of the vehicles, pedestrian, accessibility, and on, all that thing. But frankly, the point that I care mostly about is the sound and, and Pinar, any exploration of, of, of even, like, again, testing a specific, at specific strategic points we would really appreciate you looking into that and keeping this into into consideration as, as you move forward in your discussions. Hold on. Do, do you want to answer anything or? <laughs> I think we can start with the sound. Um, you know, we we had that discussion, <laughs> the parks department. <laughs> I mean, you know, the honestly, the sound barrier is is nothing that either agency could take on and maintain, right? There's so many challenges with the barrier that has been implemented in the past. We really also wanted to rely on more nature-based sound barriers, like the, if you go back to that slide, um, Doug, um, Anita, the half of the pathway is gonna be utilizing some green sound barrier. So, one thing that we've been discussing is, would that be enough along that um, points that you are highlighting um, to avoid the sound? So it's like, what is it, um, Dahlia? You have the linear part of the... Yeah, about 50% of the <laughs> corridor, you know, we're like in this example where um, Ankita is showing where we have the space, we're heavily, you know, going to heavily plant that area. And then even in the other sections, we are going to be planting. It's just going to, we don't have the space necessarily, you know, for as large, you know, uh, trees, but, you know, we'll still have shrubs, you know, it, and we are raising the height of the wall in between the Deegan and the existing corridor. Um, uh, you know, so within the court, you know, adjacent to the corridor, um, it's generally going to be about you know three feet higher than the uh, finished grade of the path. Um, and uh, so there will be um, some barrier, um, but you know, it is going to be a balance also of light versus you know the 
you know, that, that was a key thing also that we were trying to think about because, you know, we also didn't want to create, a, you know, this dark confined corridor. Um, so there's a lot of challenges there. <laughs> um, I will say with the width of the paths, I don't know if we want to jump to that. Um, 11 feet wide, if you think about it, that is a typical like minimum sidewalk width is about five feet wide. Um, a typical mm -hmm. two-way greenway is about eight to 10 feet wide. So this is, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to maximize that space as much as possible. Uh, it should allow for two-way traffic um, as well as somebody, you know, stepping off a little bit, uh, you know, but it is designed as a, a shared bike path. Right? I mean, a shared greenway. It's not a bike path with a pedestrian path adjacent to it. It's going to be a shared path. Um, but we are very limited in space. You know, some of the corridor widths, you know, get down to, you know, 25 feet. So, and we have to fit the stream and the path <laughs> and- And um, the planting, the yeah, buffers. And, and trying to create those buffers. Um, so we are very limited. And then I apologize, the, the third question, the in-between question I was going to answer. The only one thing I wanted to add also on the path is we are also trying to undulate it. So, you know, we are using- you know, elevation and 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 other ways of, you know, controlling speed and and like so that it's not that cyclists are just kind of uh, moving through and stuff like that. So so some of that thought is being uh, given to uh, to that, and and then I think on the porous versus the asphalt. Mm -hmm. So anything that is at grade, uh, and that's a trailway, that is all going to be porous. If it's elevated or parking lot, that'll be asphalt. I don't know. And then also where it's on top of the pipe, because the the portion um, when it you know in the southern portion after the intake structure, that uh, path is going to be directly on top of the pipe. So it's basically going to be paved over the pipe, and so there isn't uh, enough soil there to create a. I mean, it's going to be on top. Right. Of the right. Pipe. Great. Yeah. We understand. Thank you so much. With this step, I would like to invite our both committee, uh, how to say, members of both committees to raise their hands. Uh, I know I have in the room both, I believe, Bob and David and, and Bob um, uh, Bender that want to, to ask questions. But everybody, again, committee members, please raise your hands on Zoom so that we see who wants to speak or, or has questions. Um, I, I'm, I'm moving here, look, into ben, Bob Bender is next to me. so. Oh. Okay. I'll start with him until we see people on Zoom. <laughs> Location. Uh, I want to be clear on the uh, on the process from this point. Um, you're going to the PDC in August, is that correct? And so, what ha are you taking this design that we're seeing tonight to the PDC? The same design we're looking at. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what happens at the PDC? This is this is a uh, if I if I remember correctly, it's something like a 75% approval. I'm, I'm not entirely clear on what that means and what follows. Um, they will provide comments um, or um, on the, our preliminary design, and then those would get incorporated into our final design, and then we'd submit again a final design. And if they have any further comments, you know, those would be provided. But the uh, intent is usually that we just incorporate their comments and should be good to go you know, uh, at the final design. So if that all happens, the final design would be when? Our target date uh, for final design is this uh, is to finish up um, in uh, October, I think end of September, beginning of October for the final design, based on any comments that we get from them in August. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm moving to Bob Fanosi. We do one one. Yeah, I am seeing one, no um, hands on on Zoom. Oh, so Bob Fanosi. One one yeah. one follow up question, uh, just on that is: Will there be another presentation then to the community board um, after the final design before they go to PDC for the final design? We can definitely accommodate that. I mean, we'll be glad to either to come into board or to tag or both. Yeah, I mean, I think that it would be, yeah. this is the 75% mark, right? And we're giving you some feedback, and certainly they'll give you some feedback. And then it would be great to have one last look to see what the plan is. So that way everybody is on the same page because there'll be this 
lull for a year while the construction happens and gets things get into place. And it'd be great to know what exactly to expect. Sure. Yeah, we can do that in the fall. And just to note, there is going to, we're anticipating a, I'm oh, sorry, just to note, we're anticipating a gap of about a year for procurement process. So, you know, there'll be design will complete, our plan is design, you know, we get comments and we incorporate the, you know, final comments um, into the bid package by the end of uh, January, 2024. And then, uh, but, you know, we're not anticipating construction starting for another year. Um, you know, year plus after that because of the, the length of the procurement process. But Dalia, just, Robert, yeah, just to be precise, then... I think our, our schedule, sorry. I, I said just to clarify that for De, uh, De, Deborah is, we, you know, we're going to go to the PDC in August. We're going to get their comments. We're going to complete our design process, uh, final design. And once that's completed, then we will go back to CD8 and then go back to PDC for final approval before we provide the bid ready drawings by the end of January. So that's the process. So there is one more round of review between, between our final design and 100% construction bid ready documents. Thank you. Okay, Robert Fanuzi, please. Cool. Um, I really want to throw you all a bouquet um, because, <laughs> and I'm going to make it with native plants, actually, um, because I really feel this does represent a next generation of greenway design. I, I don't see another one like this in New York City. And specifically, um, what I feel you've done is really emphasize First of all, you've created a whole new urban ecology in which not just buffers, but native plants take the role here are, are strong design features that PDC will recognize as a step forward um, for every reason, for resilience, for sound ending, for heat island. You have really made the native plants um, more than just decoration. They, um, this is an ecological greenway. Um, and we really appreciate the attention to not just environmental productivity, but to the vestigial landscape that you're recovering. Uh, I've never seen a more um, a thoughtful um, recovery of that lost urban landscape, which was a forest, and you're bringing it back in a great way. So um, just, I thank you. I, I think this is something that the city should recognize that it's new to more of. This is an, an environmental greenway. Um, I, I want to say with the, uh, we talked about the two-year um, procurement, but um, yeah. do you anticipate this? Does this become then a natural resource and all that that means in terms of maintenance and protections and all that? Um, it's not just decorative. I mean, this this is there's a lot of beautiful things going on here. So that's something down the road. Um, just tag that um, because it, you really are creating natural resources there. Um, so about thinking about it in terms of management and protection down the road. You know, I, I just wanted to name that. Um, and also what what Deb said about telling a story through the uh, street furniture and the signage. I think the nature tells the story um, so beautifully in the way I said. Um, and if the, I think a guideline is let the street furniture match the incredible um, productivity of the natural landscape you're creating there just as a byword for going forward. I just think that um, there was a little bit of a mismatch in that the street furniture was uh, slick and modern and um, there's something beautiful happening in the, um, I mean, we all, it was, it was, it looked a little actually Highline like uh, to me compared to the the Bronx landscape that was you were bringing back. So that's that's just fantastic. Um, two requests. Um, one of them was um, the um, I wasn't under wasn't particular. So thank you. I, I wasn't absolutely clear what was happening for vehicular access at 239th. What vehicle did that mean? Was that maintenance and like garbage access? And then the off-ramp at 230th, because as you know, we're desperately interested in continuing a greenway, um, both streetwise and MTA-wise. 
So um, we wanted to know the exit ramp at 230 and how that we, we are building so that it can be continued with a, a number of different contingencies. But I have to say that this is, I'm stunned, this is a beautiful, I think, paradigm shifting design for the city of New York. Um, I can take the 239th Street access one, and then maybe Pinar, if you want to um, speak to the other question. Um, for the 239th Street, the idea was really that um, for larger maintenance vehicles, particularly to access the Jerome Park Reservoir um, blow-off structure uh, that I know you know we've talked about in the past, and we didn't go into a lot a lot of detail here. Um, that they could the vehicles could enter at 239th Street go straight up um, and then uh, cross the bridge and then kind of back up just that little piece instead of having to come from the parking lot of the Van Cortland Park parking lot. Um, that just makes that easier and minimizes the amount of paved area that we need to do, you know, provide in order to uh, have a vehicle turn around, <laughs> which becomes difficult um, and avoids having the vehicle having to back up to far um, a distance. So it, it's really mainly for that uh, purpose. Um, the parks uh, department, as well as um, any larger parks maintenance vehicles, but the uh, thought process is that generally uh, the parks vehicles are going to be um, more of the gator, smaller vehicles um, that can, you know, go on the greenway uh, without any trouble. Um, but it allows for that flow through all the way to the back. And then from that Jerome Park Reservoir, then they can um, pull forward um, into the parking lot. Um, it, you know, and then it also allows for uh, like police vehicles or, or anyone to also do that, but mainly it's it's for the DP maintenance vehicles. All right, I think- um, so will, it, will it be Ballard's or something? How will it, will it be yeah, a gate? Yeah, um, so there's gonna be gates and we're still coordinating with parks exactly on the details of that, but the thought is um, gates with a Ballard as well in the middle so that um, if both gates don't, are open, it still will prevent a vehicle from going through. Um, then at 2.30. Yeah, and that way, you know, whether one door is open versus two, uh, it wouldn't, you know, necessitate, uh, you know, somebody to have to go around to open both doors or, you know, uh, you know manually close one door. Yeah, the 230th Street, you know, we are um, down there. It's the MTA that you all know. Um, and we are currently working with the Metro North um, to get the easement agreement, which we hope that they will indeed going to allow us um, at least to build the closed circuit, the pipe that goes along the railroad, and then we connect back to our out hold downstream of that regulator. So the discussion with Metro North that um, you all know has been going on for some time now. We still have and obtained the draft easement agreement, but they promised us it's coming soon enough. So we are anxiously waiting for Metro North um, to get that draft, draft easement agreement. Um, in the future, if there's gonna be an agreement at IT Parks and DOT, are also working with Metro North that there is going to be an access that uh, our project is is going to allow that right. We are not precluding a future access, but at this point, the agreement, the draft easement agreement um, that we are obtaining from Metro North is only for the closed pipe that's adjacent. I, I understand, to Metro North but North. what will there be a wall there? Like, what will we see when we reach two thirty Street? I, I oh, definitely I understand see. where we are. Okay, in the so what will it look we, like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we have that um, drawing? Okay, here we go. It's the yeah. fence with the, yeah. Well, yeah, so Pinar, I, I guess um, from that standpoint, um, the pedestrians are going to be routed onto the ramp to get them up to 230th okay. Street. The part that's shown in gray, that's the maintenance access road that would be kind of off. To, um, there would be a fence um, that from the path um, with the same kind of aluminum fence that we're, we're using elsewhere uh, to prevent vehicles and people from going into that area. Um, but there'll also be a chain link fence underneath the 
um, 230th uh, overpass um, just to provide, you know, additional safety precautions really from people to uh, go into that underpass area. Um, Jane Link, okay. Um, that, that might be jarring, but, you know, assign anything I know you can't put a coming soon, like southbound extension coming soon, but anything to beautify that terminus would be great. Um, and a chain link fence definitely sends a message. Um, if you could think about ways to um, make that as beautiful as the rest of the rest of the signage and the fencing and all that you have. Why wouldn't it be the steel picket fence? You show, that is something uh, that we yeah we could consider that. Okay. Are you good, Robert? Uh, Deb, I'm moving over to David Gelman. We kind of did one, 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 one yeah. committee with the other committee, but I don't see any other that, hands. But just to remind also fun. everybody, we are at 8.15. If there are other committees members that want to raise their hands, raise their hands now, because if not, we are moving after this phase to CB8 members and public. David. Okay. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say this is, uh, as Bob was uh, suggesting, uh, or it's dating really, this is far nicer than what we saw. Uh, what we saw was a, uh, no pun intended, but uh, parallel uh, tracks of uh, um, a concrete channel and a pathway a little bit above it. Now I, I, I like the idea that it seems to meander back and forth, uh, each of them. The, the stream seems to meander and the path seems to meander over it uh, onto both sides which is um, very, very nice. But I wanted to be clear on one thing. Um, the, uh, the previous design, it was just a concrete channel. Uh, several of these slides suggest that it's really going to be a vegetation-filled channel. It may have concrete under it or whatever, but there will be what you will see is not concrete, but vegetation and water. Is that true? Okay, good. Um, uh, two other things. <clears throat> uh, there's nothing there now, uh, but it's been raised in the past, and I hope that you will, it, 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 you know, make it part of probably the final design. But definitely, we are our experience um, that, uh, on the Putnam Trail uh, makes us very, very concerned that the Putnam Greenway, Putnam South, will become a motorbike haven. Um, I don't know how you deal with it particularly because you got to allow other vehicles there. Uh, you probably need a minimum 36 inches for wheelchairs, et cetera. So I don't know how you deal with it, but that is a big concern that should definitely be incorporated in the final design. Um, and uh, I have a sort of a, a technical question. Um, if we were to get um, access below 230th Street, I, I know that's not ne necessarily in the future, but uh, I think we all want it. I believe we all want it. Would it actually, from a hydraulic engineering perspective, be good or even better than shoving it all into a pipe uh, uh, to go underneath the tracks and into the Harlems? W would it actually serve your needs to do that? Because we want that. We said that from the start. We said that for decades. I think I'm going to let Sandeep answer that, but we looked at, like, we have to close the pipe, right, um, around along 230 seconds, not because of metro load, but because of the constraint and the adjacent properties that are there, and they are not going to be moving anywhere, or we cannot contact them. put property. a wall on their side as well. So. Yeah, I mean, we, we looked into that, but it's not a possible option engineering wise that so we have to close the pipe and then opening the pipe at 230 on the metro north it's going to be challenging from the h and h perspective but sandy you have done that modeling and the calculation so feel free to chime in why the engineer no, is not going to work it up yeah. Uh, no, I think you covered it well, and I I, I guess the the only uh, the only uh, that once it goes into a pipe and uh, 
we, we still need to use the existing outfall, outfall into Harlem River to use the water. So at some point, we have to bring it back in a pipe and then asking the stream to go in a pipe, come out of a pipe, go back in a pipe. I mean, the, 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 that's going through a lot of machination. So, uh, so but, but a greenway could still exist. I mean, whatever design that we are doing, even if the hydraulic component isn't there, the greenway could be as part of that. And even if this is a pipe, you could still have like an upland natural ecology if it's not wetland um, in the lower sections. Yes, I, I, I understand. Notwithstanding the issue at 232nd Street and the garage properties immediately to the west, assuming that you could flow directly to the Harlem and maybe the last 30 or 40 yards, you got to go, you know, pipe to get underneath the railroad tracks of, of the actual Metro North Hudson line. Assuming that you had the free flow, would that work hydraulically? So, um, David, I'm going to hop in here just as the chair, just because it's getting late. Um, I think your question is actually kind of very theoretical and not re relative to this specific uh, yeah, project. Yeah, I because asked it for a reason, I've had conversations with them. I just want a straightforward answer to this question. Thank well, you. The the, the, the if, if 232nd Street and there were no issues there and and and, and those were not the low-lying properties, <laughs> then we could have the intake structure further south. Yes, I mean, that's what the original design was. It was only when we saw the conditions on Naples Terrace that we could not accommodate, uh, uh, coexist uh, an open channel and those low-lying properties there. So if that situation suddenly got removed or uh, the, 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 there was uh, uh, nothing there, uh, then the, the intake structure could be moved uh, further south. And you're right. I mean, so so hydraulic, the, 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 uh, the hydraulically, the grade is there, but th th this condition does not precludes us from doing it. That's all. And Very the, good. that's a professional engineering answer I'm looking for. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, David. I think we are all there with you in, in the spirit of the big, big long-term aim here. So, but also we have to deal with this piece at this time. And, and we really appreciate the question and the answers and the explanations because it gives us hope. It gives us a way to move forward, knowing that actually there, there, there are technical possibilities and we can advocate in, in the future. Um, seeing no other hands up from committee members and reminding everyone the committees must pass a resolution which we have prepared, I'm inviting any other uh, CB8 members that want to ask questions or members of the public that want to ask questions to raise their hands at this point. But be so kind and be to the point, both in questions and in answers. And I see one hand that went up, Carlos. Carlos, please proceed. Oh, sorry. Well, no, give me one second. Uh, I have Carlos and Jody. I will go with Jody because she's sort of an affiliated member. And Carlos, <laughs> Carlos I'll go to you after. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, Carlos was a board member. OK, great. Jody, please proceed. Carlos. Please, thank you. I'm counting on your understanding here. <laughs> thank you. I, I will be very short. Um, I believe that there is a new ULERP coming through for a development of some of the properties that are currently not built all the way to their lat lines. Will, if that happens and those properties expand their footprints, I think the parking lot is one of the properties. Um, has that possible impact been factored into how it might affect the hydrology, the runoff, the low-lying areas, the experience, all of the things that might happen if, if bigger buildings with bigger footprints were put on the west side of, of the, the, the path? <laughs> Um, who would like to take that question? I only ask hard but, questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, you want me to do that? I, I think the design incorporates everything within city-owned property and city-owned corridor. So all the elements that we are designing that include the hydraulic requirements, the landscaping, as well as the 
uh, greenway and pathway conveyance things. They, they will all will be contained within our property. I, I, I mean, the only if if the buildings build up to their uh, lot line, the only drawback would be the the space would feel a little bit more confined. But that's not something we can control. That's yeah. so that the, but but it, it by them building to their lot lines. It will not preclude us from doing anything that we are already doing. That's and I'll that's, just add also that they won't be draining, they're not allowed to drain their property onto this property. They have to connect to the sewer system in the street. So uh we're they legally they can't be you know directing their runoff onto a onto a private, you know, another private property, which this would be. Yeah, we Great. all know no one's Carlos? supposed to, but oh, thank sorry. you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Jody. Uh, Carlos, would you uh, unmute yourself and, and ask? Hi. Um, so in light of David's question about the, the daylighting having vegetation, I was wondering if there's any consideration of the water chestnut. Um, it's, a, it's a really invasive species that's already colonized the Van Cortlandt Lake and goes well up Tibbetts Brook into Yonkers. Oh, right. uh, and of course, you know, you're doing such a beautiful job designing this. It'd be disappointing if it became immediately colonized by like this dense monoculture. I I guess we, we I mean we are the first phase one. I think in Pinar's presentation or Pinar or John, you want to elaborate on that. We are already trying to address some of the water chestnut issues in Van Cortlandt Lake, and we are doing it preemptively, not waiting for this project. Uh, but, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. John. You know, Pinar. Pernar mentioned, you know, phase one is doing a improvement of the lake itself. And that's, uh, you know, removing invasive you know, vegetation along the shoreline, uh, replanting with native vegetation, and then also having a two-year program to oh, wow. remove water chestnut and then, you know, any other floating uh, invasive aquatic. So, you know, they don't, we'll try to get as much as, as, much as we can out. Um, but as you well know, I mean, it's not a... It's not a one and done. You know, it does require some follow-up intervention, but the first project will be a great, you know, will substantially reduce it. Sure. I was just wondering from the perspective, like if there was a structural element of design to mitigate its like ability to flow into the, the daylit channel or something like that, beyond just, you know, obviously the continual work of removing it. We will have trash racks no. on the structure um for the daylighting um and about underflow baffles so we are trying to collect um vegetation and debris from the lake upstream of the structure as well um but you know seeds could will you know be able to are so small they they'd be able to pass it yeah no we'll look at that both upstream you know on the upper bridge on the putnam trail you know, you don't want to have the control. Well, you, I guess you could have a control before it's daylighted, but you want your controls a little further upstream. Um, but a second one could be down by the daylighted portion. But you know, we're aware of that, and you know, we we need to we need to work on that. Okay. okay thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Seeing no other hands at this point, I'm closing the sort of Q and A uh, session. And I'm kindly asking Ankita to stop sharing her screen while emailing us her presentation. And, and just thanking the entire DEP uh, team here. We really guys appreciate so much. We see so much attention to detail. We see so much thoughtfulness. We see really so much progress uh, from, from last year. We really appreciate you, you being so so open-minded and receptive to everything that, that was said in previous years. And literally in each and every single meeting and each and every single Zoom we had, we saw added value. So we just want you to know that we uh, recognize it. And also we recognize how you will have to pass the torch to, to parks and the challenges that, that will come with that. And just in advance, thanks parks for, for trying to accommodate such a complex project and, and, and then being there ready to kind of receive the torch, right? Uh, at some point in the future, we know we, it's still ahead of us, but we really thank both of you and we really with all the agencies who you have to interact to, to make this project move forward. We are absolutely thrilled and we really appreciate, we really appreciate 
uh, the work of each and every single one of you as, as part of the team and, and collaborating with, with us and listening to the community board on this. Having said all these things, um, if you would like to stay on your, of course, welcome to. It's a public meeting. But then now the two committees are moving into the phase of discussing the resolution that we, we will uh, put forward for full board. Uh, if you would like to say a couple of closing words, Pinar, or anybody from uh, the team, we are uh, out loud applauding yeah, us here. <laughs> I, I think, you know, it, it, it took all of us to come together, right, for this great project. Hopefully, we'll set the precedent for many more. Um, you all know we recently announced the new green infrastructure modification. Um, yeah. Looking forward to see you all in, in a week um, for our gathering. but. We are hoping this is going to set the template to build more Tibet <laughs> like daylighting in the city. So I really appreciate. So we are going to run with it and apply the lessons learned to other projects that we can call um, in our toolbox green infrastructure. So thank you all so much for, for really having us and giving us this great feedback. We um, made a note of your comments and really looking for the resolution, hopefully soon. And, yeah, um, and thank you. I just you also, so I'd like to, and... I'm just going to get a word to yeah. address around Dr. Amelia. I want to thank mm -hmm. uh, also everybody as well from the Parks Committee. Um, just to thank you for attending. And this is going to be a beautiful greenway. And thanks everybody on the Parks uh, staff and the Parks uh, Department for all of the hard work with all of this. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a lot more conversations to come but uh, it really has developed and we really appreciate you. The, the partnership. It's been a real partnership here, so thank you. Um, and then Camille, we need to jump over to our resolution. Yes, that's what I was, yes, yes thank, thank you, you. Thank you, thank you again, everyone. Uh, this next section of, of the agenda is where uh, open strictly to the two committees and I will go into sharing my screen and um, okay. Okay, this is what we have prepared and um, it's only a one page so I do hope we will not linger very, very long but again everybody is absolutely open, uh, welcome to, to raise their hands and, and address things. I will start reading it fairly fast. I will refer to ENS for Environmental Sanitation, PNR Parks and Recreation, DP you know, uh, DPR is Department of Parks and Recreation, all right, okay. So this will go to full board as um, as a resolution from the joint meeting of Bronx CB8, ENS, and, and PNR committees. Uh, Tibet Brook Daylighting and Putnam Greenway project response from May 24, 2023 meeting. So from this meeting right now. Whereas NYC DP and NYC DPR are scheduled to present on August 14, 2023 to NYC Public Design Commission, the preliminary 75% design on the Tibet Brook Daylighting and Putnam Greenway project that we call the project and whereas uh, CB8 passed on June 29, 2022, a resolution with a detailed history of our support to the goals and concepts of the DEP and DPR application to NYC PDC conceptual design and Whereas DEP and DPR presented the current status on the project to the general public on virtual meetings held on December 14, 2022 and April 24, 2023, a public site walkthrough on April 26, 2023, and a DEP and DPR presentation to this joint meeting today. Whereas the City of New York announced on January 18, 2023, reaching of an agreement to purchase purchase of the CSX to purchase the CSX property. All right. Therefore, be it resolved that Bronx CB8, ENS, and PNR committees strongly support the DEP and DPR preliminary design submission on the project anticipated to be presented to NYC PDC on August 13, 2023. Be it further resolved that uh, Bronx CB8, ENS, and PNR committees review the DEP and DPR 2023 presentations against our priorities stated in the June 29, 2022 joint resolution passed by CB8 full board, finding that our stated concerns have been sufficiently addressed. 
and be further resolved that the Joint Committees recommend maximization of the use of porous materials in order to allow the highest degree of natural, ab natural absorption and drainage capacity within the Greenway and adjacent floodplain as recommended by the Bronx CB8 resolution passed May 13, 2014. Let me admit that here. Be it further resolved that the Joint Committees request designers study and implement to the highest degree feasible noise mitigation measures to alleviate noise impacts from the major Deegan Expressway, especially at public gathering points along the Greenway. And finally, be it further resolved that the Joint Committees consider this project an example of innovative, sustainable, and equitable design of public spaces and civic structures, and highly appreciate the responsiveness of the DEP and DPR teams to community feedback, and look forward to receiving regular updates on the project. This is the resolution. Uh, anybody having any further comments? And uh, here, please hold on. Let me see how do I see participants list from this thing. Uh, you see on. participants, click on that. I do, I do, I see now. Okay. I see, uh, I see Laura uh, Spalter has her hand Laura up. Spalter. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Laura, please. Uh, it's excellent. I only have one suggestion. I think the second, be it further resolved, reads yes. better as a whereas, because it's saying that uh, I, I kind of agree with DPR you. presentations against our priorities, finding that the stated concerns have been sufficiently addressed. Yeah. That's like a fact I to me in the whereas. A note from David. We accept that. We accept, oh, Bo Bo Farnos, you accept it, Bob Bender? Yeah, in trying right. to accept? Okay, great. Yeah. I'm kind I think of that's good. And it's a whereas. Language. Yeah, so uh, that so would be a whereas. The acquisition? Yeah. Or right before there. the acquisition. Just it, would be the, it would be the last whereas and helps explain why we accept it, you know, that first be it resolved. So that's. Laura, you yeah. want it as the last whereas, no problem. It's excellent. So it should go down one more, but you can do that in a minute. Whereas Bronx CB8. Okay, okay, okay. Hold on. Give me one second. Let me finalize this right here. And you said it's the last whereas, mm -hmm. correct? Okay, great. Okay, we're there good. Go. Um, any it's other forward. thoughts? No. Yes, David, please. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether it should be whereas or probably a, be it further resolved. Uh, the, um, just before the last one, similar to the uh, the previous one, the Joint Committee's Request Designer Study, in, in the same fashion uh, that they um, study and um, um, negotiate or or communicate to the degree possible with the MTA about uh, continuing this uh, greenway all the way to the, the Harlem, uh, uh, the Metro North Harlem. Uh, Metro North Hudson Rail tracks, where it, then it would go underneath mm -hmm. the tracks. Mm -hmm. um, my personal answer, I think I shared with parts uh, before, would be to be cautious in terms of not mixing things. Like we want to give these people the green light on what they showed us uh, mm -hmm. all the way to 2:30. Personally, I am not. Obviously, I support the, the idea of the mm -hmm. suggestion. I just don't know if I want to mix it, but I think worth it properly. We could consider it, but. I, I'm I asking now for feedback from my other members. So I would say I don't I don't think it should be in this resolution. I think that um, because when when Pilar is talking about negotiations that they're having currently regarding like the easement, that's really for the pipe and to, and to get the water across the property. It has nothing to do with the greenway. Even though we we definitely want to have the two thirtieth to two twenty fifth be become a greenway. I think that we should consider a separate distinct resolution supporting that, but, um, you know, to encourage, yeah, yeah, yeah. you well, know, no, no, but I don't think it should be part of this. This should be one, this has a single singular purpose and it's not that greenway. Yeah, I, I actually agree now with, with that, but I have two hands the, here. Mm -hmm. I have Robert Fanuzzi, and mm -hmm. then I also see uh, Laura. Laura, I don't know if you're- No, 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 that was from old, before. But I, that was from before. Okay, great. But then I see, then, then David wanted oh. to respond, and then there's Karen. David, do you mind if we go Robert, Karen, and- Okay, great. It's an important issue that deserves an hold meeting it mm -hmm. and a separate action to it. The okay. PDC submission. Mm -hmm. PDC is not judging on South of 220. Oh, let me address that directly. 
Um, we, this is our statement. To the point of order. Point of uh, order. You have to wait. I asked no, the chair to adopt it. No, I know, I know, but order. he wanted a quick response, Karen. Give me just one moment. I know Karen has pressed. David, are you okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, that uh, this is our resp uh, uh, response to the design to the PDC. We should be telling the PDC that we want that stretch included in this greenway. Yeah, but the presentation was not addressed. It doesn't matter. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, one second, guys. guys. So, Dave, so we're point of order now. David, you've spoken. Now we need to, you need to move on. Yes, Karen, please. Karen Argenti, do you hear us? I thought someone else was before me. I, I thought there was another hand. No, no, no there was an answer from uh, from David to, to Robert here in front of me, but you... You're okay, right. I, I think this project, I think that, pos that position is something that belongs, as they stated, to the New York City DOT. And I think we should refer it to the Traffic and Transportation Committee of Community Board 8 to try to figure out how to get that done. And we should probably yeah. make a separate motion. Please not this meeting, because we really want to get finished with this meeting. And we have another yeah. topic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe we it. put it on the agenda for the next meeting, whenever we have, yeah. when, David, I don't know. Yeah. Hold on, D David, may I just, yeah, no. So, so, yeah, so no, moving no, on here, we need second. to, I don't yes. think we have enough, uh, David. I appreciate your David. I appreciate your concern. I'm the chair as well, so I'm just gonna uh, jump ahead here for a second. Um, you know, I appreciate your concern, David, but the, I don't think you have any consensus to to add this, and so I don't think we'll be adding it to this resolution. So, is there anybody have any other uh, friendly uh, amendments or changes they would like to make to this resolution? When no, all the okay, members David, of both committees yeah. haven't been polled. But please don't editorialize. David, David, no, David, I'm speaking. Point of order. David, yes, Deb, give me one moment here. Uh, uh, yes, David. It is 8:42. We heard you. So I'm just yes, going to say. Deb, one second. Deb, would you Deb? let uh, Camelia speak? Okay, it's okay, David. It's David, okay. you're not. Guys, you should guys, not be speaking. Guys, just, I cannot, guys, one second. David, Camille, I think we are all in agreement with you conceptually, but we also have other things cooking as far as one agenda today, and also plans. Even reaching out, and we had the correspondence pending with the office to uh, MTA, asking them for even for, to allow us to do a tour. So I, I heard you. I heard mm -hmm. it's a concern we all share, but we do want to keep things separate. And oh, like a majority, would you agree that a majority of the people agree to keep it as it is? So, so with that being said, I am oh, moving on as oh, far as closing so, the debate. Correct. Oh, yeah. So I move question. we close. Yes. I saw you. Good. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, De Deborah, uh, we have a, a motion to close the debate. Which and second. Second. Do, we have a, do we have a second? Second. Anybody mm -hmm. against the motion to close the debate? No. Anybody? No, we don't need. We don't vote the on the motion. We, okay, we're not. Good. We're not so voting on the, 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 the. We have a second. Yes. So can I? Uh, how many? So we, we're we're going into uh, to voting. We're going to vote as one committee, okay. um, both and parks and economics. For both finances on voting on the resolution, is this correct? I'd like to make a motion to vote to pass this resolution in support of this resolution. I second that. Seconded. The motion yeah. is on the table to pass to pass this resolution as you see it on the screen and as read. Anybody I, against? David is against in the room. There. Anybody? Hold on, hold on. Anybody else against? Let me scroll through. No, good. Anybody abstaining? No, good. Therefore, we have opposed David Gelman. And then we have everybody else in favor. Uh, and this is the resolution, and I thank you. Thank you. Yay, all thank right. you all. Let's get on to the next. All right. Yes. Karen, so I'm so sorry, Karen, what did you say? We're moving, she wanted to move on to the next uh, article on the agenda. 
Um, I so am. That, that's... Let me stop screening. Let me save this on my desktop right here. David, your position what, what? was um, noted. So, uh, Camelia, um, uh, I'm gonna. Well, since you're while you're doing that, I'm gonna I'm gonna move us along with the other because we can we can actually both uh, tag team. Please this. do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So um, I want to just uh, thank Barbara Huang, the project manager for the revenue division of New York City Parks, and Alec Han, uh, the chief of concessions, um, for coming and joining us this evening to discuss the Mashalu Golf Course uh, RFP request that they sent a, a request for comment uh, to the community board. Um, the Mashalu Golf Course is in uh, Van Cortlandt Park. It um, has a, a it's run by a concession agreement, and that concession agreement is about to expire. Um, as part of the process, the, um, the, the concessions unit of the Parks Department um, sends out comments, uh, request comments from um, uh, local community members, such as the community board. Um, we felt that we didn't have enough to, we had just enough information to have concerns and not enough information to assuage them. And so we invited uh, Barbara and Ken, or Alex to come this evening. Um, and then um, I believe we'll also be, um, so we, We'll also have a presentation this evening quickly from uh, DDC um, regarding the wet cells specifically at the Mashalu Golf Course. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Barbara so that she can, uh, or Alex, to make opening uh, comments and, and to get us started. And thank you both for hanging on uh, to a meeting with the, had a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff to talk about. So we really appreciate you staying. Thank you very much, everybody, for inviting us. Um, we're happy to attend and, you know, anytime we're invited, um, you know, as, as a courtesy on, on, on any concession matters, we're happy to attend. Uh, perhaps in the future, we can work with CB8 a little bit on the, on, uh, on the agenda, because I promise we will not, you know, uh, spend, uh, you know, hours to talking about our topics. But we do want to hear your comments um, as it relates to the upcoming RFP. And um, before we get into, um, you know, any questions you may have regarding uh, the scope of the uh, upcoming RFP for Mashalu. <clears throat> I think uh, this is a good opportunity for DDC um, to give us all an update on the status of the capital project because th that'll be a good segue um, in, into what we were thinking about the, the, the upcoming RFP. I do wanna also note that um, we're, we're joined by, by Barbara, who is our project manager and will handle the upcoming RFP. Uh, we also have Lindsay Schott, who is our project manager for uh, the Riverdale um, Riding Stables. And uh, last but not least, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Tony McCary, who is our uh, uh, Director of Concessions, Architecture and Development, um, and has been very working very closely with DEC and DEP on the, on the Moshu project. So um, that being said, I I'll turn it over to, I believe it's uh, Lewis from, uh, from DDC for an overall project update. Oh, actually, I think it's Anna first, but. <laughs> Hi, do you need to use a screen? Yes, we uh, have to use the screen. He has a small presentation. Okay, Luis, I'll make you co-host, okay? Um, make Villa follow the co-host because it will be the one presenting. Uh, that's uh, my computer. Villa yes. That's his. That's his last name. Um, it's but it's his computer. So if you should be able to see on this on the screen under participants of Villa Fauna. What's the what first letter? <laughs> uh, v I L L. Oh V. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Villa Fauna. I C A C C. Yes. Okay. Coming your way. Uh, okay. And I think you can start introducing yes. us. Good yep. evening, everyone. Uh, we are here, at New York City Department of uh, Design and Construction. I'm with Outreach uh, Notification Department. My colleague, obviously, is Louis Villafon, Project Manager for Public Buildings with DDC. And Louis will talk you through the presentation for the current and above ground structure and la uh, landscaping. Oh. You ready, Louis? Yeah, I'm trying to make sure it's sharing the right screen. It didn't do that. <laughs> we'll just uh, yeah, I'm working to the end. Thank you. Does everyone see? Oh, yeah, there it is. Yes. Thank you, Welcome, Lewis. everyone. So this will be we're going to update us from the last time we presented, which I believe was in January, and go over some of the items that have to segue into Parks's decision on the RFP. So. Uh, 
standard slide of all our the various uh, agencies we are tied to. Uh, of course, our, um, and moving on to our small agenda. We're, but primarily, so for those who don't know this project, this is like the, this is the fourth phase of this of the Van Cortland water uh, treatment facility project. This one is mostly just dealing with the 12 acres of land where we are building the golf clubhouse that's going to encircle the DEP green roof and driving range um, uh, with a range of tee boxes that are going to be used for that, including uh, parts of the facility that are going to run the water cells and uh, irrigation and reuse a lot of the excess water from the water treatment facility to be reused and used in a recreational area with wetland cells, plantings, and plenty of landscaping and tree planting uh, over here. Um, for the, hopefully everyone to know that uh, the primary sponsor for this one is EP with DDC managing, but and parks of course is the end user. And uh, we'll be working with DEP on getting this up and running for the community. Um, Graham Charles is the architects. Lero is our uh, construction manager, and our G's general contractor is uh, CNL con con Contracting. Since the last um, presentation, since the last time we presented, we had I think quarter four of 2023. It has shifted over into the second quarter of next year. A few more items have popped up that have finally been quantified to push us back a little bit. And I think on the next slide, we're going to go over what current activities and what has popped up since then. Um, um, as a note, by the way, the anticipated completion date is the date of construction completion. Um, and when we want to turn over parts of the facility over to uh, DEP and parks to prepare for the public. Um, after this date of construction completion, we're definitely going to need to take some time for regulatory approvals with the various agencies and hopefully, uh, but in the meantime, parks and DEP will have their opportunity to pr set themselves up for the for public use in the in parallel with us trying to go those regulatory approvals. Uh, since the last one, the current activities are working on, we have some parapets being installed uh, and poured recently, um, installations of face stone, or, I think we're going to see a few of our the exact the large amount of face on framing, e framing, waterproofing, which is an ongoing and important task. Uh, this, the duct work on the first floor and our, under plumbing, we have irrigation piping, the pump, the actual irrigation pump finally being in, in the process of being installed. The water sewer connection, which has been a big uh, hurdle for us um, in this particular site. Electrical, we have T box wiring, basement lighting, fire alarm wiring. Uh, and in landscaping, uh, we, have, we are planting trees, putting on topsoil, uh, lighting poles, and our flagpole is finally installed. Um, so the, the reasons for a delay, and so the overall project has, has seen delays in, entirely. Some of the first few items you're probably going to see, COVID, which we all know has affected the, the project in every project in the city. Um, we had supply chain issues, personnel shortages. It was. Uh, I, and while we have recovered from most of it, it did uh, drag the project. And we do have some lingering supply chain issues that have been aff afflicting the project since then. Um, um, other items here, uh, some field conditions we've, re we've had to deal with is a lot of additional bedrock that we didn't anticipate or <laughs> as there's a photo on the right side, you could see all that extra rock we had to deal with. And uh, I think at this point, we've finally gotten through it, but we have had to remove lots more rock than we ever anticipated to get this building uh, situated. And a few small design changes had to be some, some obsolete equipment over the years came, uh, stopped being sold or even lost some of the companies after COVID that completely collapsed and could have to get new equipment. Right, the issues with a curved building like this, uh, as we'll see in the, some of the renderings later, they have, we've run into some issues when it comes to ceiling tile placement and getting things nice and ready. And offshoot, we also have some structural modifications due to loads because uh, not everything gets placed properly and you have to make those slight adjustments and it takes time to have an engineer go through the whole process. Our newest and probably current uh, uh, blockage right now is utility issues. Our water sewer connection <laughs> that we're attempting to put uh, on Jerome Avenue has seen various amounts of unknown piping that we have to deal, uh, decipher, deal, uh, work with uh, with Con Ed to 
figure out and uh, DEP to figure out which how to handle all these unknown conditions for us to connect it. And then Condit themselves, they're, they we're working with them trying to get our gas line connection. And uh, Condit has to actually install an entirely new service pole in the area since whatever they had previously doesn't ex uh, doesn't have the capacity. And we're waiting on them to uh, greenlit that work and allow that so we could start actually testing some of our equipment in the site. But that has been taking a lot longer than they uh, initially anticipated. <laughs> Um, some fo progress photos since last one, since last, since uh, January. These, the framing for the E of the building has been going up and it's progressing uh, well. Ho hopefully in the next few months, we'll start actually putting in the panels and we'll see the building's envelope start uh, taking shape as per the renderings you'll see later. Some of the ductwork on the first floor uh, being set up. So hope, uh, so we're work. This will get us closer to the MEP items, and we can start testing and getting all this uh, duct work out of the way, so we can finally uh, uh, get to the point where we can get a little bit closer to a uh, functional building. But that is contingent on us getting our, our uh, gas and uh, electrical work. <laughs> um, some uh, there's a water. One of the water sewer test pits we have. You get to see that gas line that we have to maneuver around and has uh, causing a little bit more of an issue. I, th I think this uh, particular case caused us to need to do has some hand digging instead of actually using a machine further because we can't damage that line any further. But on the right side, we have some of the lighting poles uh, without the fixtures yet. We don't want to damage them yet. But uh, and some of the new saplings planted in uh, for the facility. Um, some of the next items, more tree plantings that we've been uh, dealing with hopefully they all they all need to start taking root and hope that hopefully by next spring we'll all start uh budding again and they'll be hopefully healthy trees um i think the project is uh and i think we still have more trees to plant till this day we're just going to finish the rest of our landscaping um and some of the things some of the top this is the image of topsoil and us aerating it and some of the, the benches being installed at the moment <laughs> Um, for those who don't know the project as well, these are some of the renderings that we're aiming to be as close as possible to. And as you can see that uh, in here, in this particular image, we could see the little amphitheater area with the curve of the building having to go right around the DEP green roof that's driving range. And you can see the T boxes in the distance um, and then how us have to, this curve has proven to be uh, taking the little bit of tweaks here or there to make sure that uh, we get what we need to function. A little bit of that, you can see the concessionaire area here and what we hope the the project will have its usage for whoever's going to be the uh, the end user, uh, the running the facility. Um, and last but not least, this is a, a picture from where it will be from Jerome Avenue standing. Uh, this uh, hopefully this will be a great asset to the community and everyone could uh, just see walk up and see this just stepping off either the Woodlong station at the Ford train or just from the regular community. Oops. <laughs> On that, this is our small update. Um, thank you. And then um, if anyone has any questions, by all means. My contact. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't have any questions. I guess if you could do the one, go back a couple of slides. I just want to confirm where the, the moat is. Um, oh, yes. So that is under these T boxes moving around. Uh, let's see. So is yeah, it right there on the, the yeah. like those, you've got those two folks yeah, walking sorry. with their golf. So right there this, is the yes, moat essentially? Yes. In between this wall and this wall is the, the moat, <laughs> as it's known. Right. This, this particular area is cell seven, and it's the last place where we start with the machinery will recycle the water and bring it all the way back to cell one. I don't have the aerial view of the entire project in this particular manner, but it's supposed to hug this uh, the DEP existing green roof, and that the water the moat runs right around it. And then is the way that this is supposed to work because I'm not a golfer is that folks will stand in those tee boxes that are off um, in the distance behind uh, that guy's in the red shirt, you know, off that way. That they'll mm -hmm. stand in those tee boxes, they'll hit the ball over the moat, and that it lands in the greens. Is that how that's supposed yes. to work? Yes. Yes. The, the moat meant to be uh, there. There must it's supposed to be very difficult to hit there unless you, of course, do it. There's always, there will be a ball net to collect balls that fall down there anyway. But um, but yeah, they're supposed to hit over the, the this little moat. It's not very far and aim and 
go towards the green roof. <laughs> so there would then be access, I guess, for staff to go get the balls and collect them and that kind yes. of thing? Yes. In here, is there's actually a, a pedestrian bridge below here that uh, goes in onto the green roof for land for tending to the landscaping the of the green roof, whoever's going to maintain the roof, and for a ball collection and ball cleaning material uh, equipment. And is the roof um, natural or um, turf or like uh, will it need to be mowed and that kind of thing? The roof is a natural green roof. Right? So I mean, uh, uh, I, so it'll require maintenance. So the, the, yes. the parks department will need to go there. So um, so as part of the the Smashaloo golf course, maybe this is the. the uh, transition into the, that the broader discussion is the the area that where the balls will be landing. Obviously, that's going to be part of the the Mashalu Golf uh, concession, uh, including the moat and then all of this above ground structure. Um, that will be better handled with uh, by Parks and Deep. That will be that is an ongoing conversation between Parks and DEP, since everything under the green roof is uh, the water treatment facility itself. <laughs> and I Got don't know it, where okay. the, the maintenance and jurisdiction starts uh, starts and ends. I think parks could better handle that question. Okay, well, I see there's one person with a hand up, so I'll take their their question yeah, and no, then we'll go open it up to the I, parks department. Deb, yeah. Deb, I had uh, first David with hands up in the room, then Dan Padernas, and then well, both panels in the room. So I got okay, it. Okay. So I didn't see David's hands. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, it's a, a very futuristic and handsome looking design that's still compatible with the park. Uh, but I had stepped out at the beginning and I, I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. This project is for the tea boxes, um, that, that uh, small amphitheater, this concessionaire area, um, and the moat and whatnot, but that and the infrastructure to support them. But that is the whole of this project. And if I remember from the first slide, it was $83 million. Or did, was that other uh, elements? Uh, that $83 million was for this project. Oh. Uh, OK. Oh. That, that if you want to go members uh, first, mm -hmm. uh, and then Dan, then it would be both Anuzi. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, mm -hmm. Uh, so Bob Panusi would be uh, next, I think, to ask his question. Hey, Deb, uh, thank you. I'm just, uh, is there a great water use for water in the cells to irrigate any natural resources in this Gulf area? Yes, there, I think some of the water being reused is also for irrigation. Um, actually, I think How and where? Primary, um, we have an irrigation pump being installed to irrigate um, the wet, the, our new, the, or there are new landscaping. <laughs> so is it connected then to the, like, so is it, does the water then kind of flow through this moat and then connects to some landscaping infrastructure? We have a cell, some of the water being used by the facility, we're using from the excess water from the facility uh, is going to be used for the wetland cells and irrigation. Um, when you say wetland cells, what is that? The moat, sorry, <laughs> the moat. I should say. <laughs> so the water will be in the moat all at all times, and will it be? Yes, a... it's supposed to be like a lazy river. <laughs> uh, Deb, both Anuzi still have some follow-ups. And um, oh, God. Okay. is this the audience from which we can get clarification of the maintenance of this um, filtration plant um, cell? Who, who will be maintaining this complex irrigation and wetlands? So that I think is the purpose of uh, that, what we were just talking about. Well, we'll need to go back to Barbara and um, Ken or Alex to talk about um, the, uh, the, the RFP and how uh, they're going to be approaching that, how Parks is approaching that. Okay, that Thank you. Next step. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, that be okay to move to, uh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, sir. Alex, you are speaking or? Great. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to, you know, defer to um, uh, Tony McCary, our, um, our director for, for um, concession development and architecture, uh, on some of the more technical aspects of the design. And, and obviously, our colleagues at DEP and, and DDC as well 
uh, who are managing the, the overall capital project. But with respect to the RFP, um, the reason I we asked for DDC to be present and to provide that update um, is really a, a segue to, to, to sort of let you know what our plans are with respect to this RFP. Um, this is a very exciting project. Um, Parks is looking forward to issuing an RFP for a long-term uh, uh, license, um, which is awarded through a competitive process, as you all know, um, seeking a concessionaire to, to manage this concession. Um, in light of the, uh, the delay that uh, DDC had described earlier in their presentation, our plan is to do a short and a long-term um, RFP. And so the RFP that we plan to issue um, you know, uh, very soon is going to be for a very short term. Um, I really can't get into the specifics because we can't reveal what is going to be in the RFP or specifically, you know, all other elements, including the scope of the RFP until the RFP is issued. And, and, and the reason for that is um, we need to preserve the competitive process uh, of an RFP. And so we're, we'll be seeking to issue a short-term RFP um, that will provide continuity of services um, and allow the concession to operate uh, while the overall DDC project is completed and all of the regulatory approvals are, um, are obtained. And so initially we were hoping that would be done by um, next year in June, which is when the current agreement with First T will expire. And um, since that will not likely be happening, we will be issuing a short-term RFP um, that will uh, seek an operator and anyone is you know, open to, to proposing on this RFP for the short term if they wish. And it'll likely be a very short term with some option um, periods in the event that there are further delays that are unanticipated. And then we would follow up with a longer term RFP and typically our golf course RFPs are anywhere between 15 and 20 years, typically they're 20. Um, once we know that the um, clubhouse and the landscaping will be completed, um, um, which is not gonna happen um, in time for uh, a transition for a new operator to move into the new clubhouse and um, enjoy the, the completion of those uh, the landscaping project. So um, that's the news that we wanted to share with you today. Um, we'll be issuing a short-term RFP and then we'll be issuing a long-term RFP. Um, with respect to some of the more technical aspects um, and some of the things that we're thinking about, I wanted to turn it over to, to Tony McCary and, and you know, uh, who's more closely, um, you know, involved with this project for many, many years. And, and so Tony, um, anything that you wanted to add here? Sure, um, th thank you, Alex. Um, so the, for the initial project, uh, the, the initial RFP, um, we don't anticipate any maintenance being um, uh, falling upon the concessionaire or parks. Um, because the construction period will still be ongoing. Um, so the status quo of maintenance um, as it's as it's happening now during the construction process will will be maintained. Um, upon completion of this license this interim license term, let's call it that, um, we do anticipate, as Alex said, a long-term plan. And that would include um, the, the very specific um, guidelines for the concessionaire to to maintain, parks to maintain, and there will be things that DEP will still be obligated to do. Um, the specifics of that is being negotiated currently by, by parks and, and DEP. We have a, a draft MOU we're working on, um, and, and um, we do have some time to, to complete that because, as, as we said, there's still a construction period ongoing. Um, but, but just to speak specifically to these, these wetland cells, which you're calling the moat, um, it really is an integral part of the design. Um, it, it, this is, it's not just a green roof. It's, I think, the largest green roof in North America. So it's, it's kind of an engineering marvel. Um, but that roof has to drain and, and that the, 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 the storm water goes into these wetland cells. Um, so it's actually, um, you know, a really clever and, and, um, intricate design to both, provide security for the for the filtration plant 
um, but also to serve as a, a way to, to filter um, water runoff. And then yes, we're gonna connect it to the, the golf course irrigation system um, and try to minimize how much of that stormwater has to go back into the sewers. So it's a, it's a very efficient, well thought out system. Um, it is complicated, but in a lot of ways, it's the beauty is in its simplicity. It's really uh, meant to, to just uh, take the runoff. It'll be a natural flow of, of, of the stormwater. Um, it will act as a lazy river, essentially, um, mostly without mechanical working parts to, to, to let that happen. There are plantings and, and, and river stone inside um, that moat. Um, it is anticipated in the long term that the concessionaire would be ultimately responsible for cleaning it out, and and there are, will be pumps that work the irrigation system, not dissimilar than other golf course uh, irrigation systems, um, and and we anticipate the golf course operator being responsible for that. So thank you so um, much, Tony. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank then you. Just to tell thank you now, there's two hands up. Yeah. Can I? Ben and Karen, just so you know, maybe we can try to wrap it, um, you know, before 9.30, I don't know if possible, but please, it's your topic. Could I, could I, could I just, just wrap up in terms of process and sequencing just so um, yes, CDA yes, is please. fully aware? Okay, so we, so we had initially issued a, a notice uh, seeking comment um, from the community board um, regarding the, the overall scope of this RFP. And so what we should talk about today is really talking about the scope of the, the shorter term RFP. In terms of sequencing, we will be issuing an additional notice once we are preparing to, to draft and issue that longer term RFP post uh, DDC capital project. And, and we're happy to, to come back and meet with you at that point to talk about those longer term obligations and, and the overall scope of, of that um, forthcoming RFP. So I just wanted to to just sort of end it with that, and and I'm sorry for taking up you know uh, that time, but but happy to to answer any other questions that that folks have. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. I just want to ask really quickly. Um, the the short term one will go to the end of construction. Obviously, you're going to have to put a date on that. Um, are you? What's the date you're assuming now that you would that you want to put on this short term RFP? So the, the current uh, agreement will expire in June of 2024. Right. We, will be, we, we anticipate issuing an, uh, this short-term RFP to be something like one year with one or two option years in the event that there are other unforeseen delays in, in, in the capital project. And then, mm -hmm. um, and then in about a year from now, we would then issue a, a new notice um, for that longer term RFP, which again, we're happy to, to come back and meet with you all on. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go to yes, questions. Uh, Karen uh, is on the committee, so I'll let Karen go first and then Dan. Yes, so um, I don't know um, what you think is coming into the moat or what the purpose of the moat is, but I could tell you what the reason why there's a moat and why it's around the, the thing, it's because they built a filtration plant underground, even though it isn't underground, it's about three stories above ground, but it is technically underground. And in doing so, they displaced the groundwater. So there is not gonna be a mild stream here. You're gonna have a lot of water here. You could probably irrigate the whole golf course and even the one down at Van Cortland Park when you get finished. And and it's, it's not stormwater from the filtration plant because that's going into the combined sewer overflow on Jerome Avenue. This is groundwater that can't go into the combined sewer overflow because I have no idea why, but there's a technical biological reason not to combine the water with the other water. Um, and so I don't know how much water it is that's going to be there. I think you should find out how much water how often it has to be changed, what it's going to be, um, it, it, how it's going to be treated. And, and, and in reality, I understand that you're looking at it from a concessionaire point of view, but that is an entity that belongs to the filtration plant. It is a DP problem. It happens to be in the middle of this pro construction project. So, um, in my opinion, and I think if you'll hear Bob Fiduzzi, he'll say the same thing, 
that problem should be taken care of by the DEP, just as they should take care of the roof of their building that they put in that is underground and you can't really see. What's my uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Karen. Uh, my other question, I have another question. I have another question, which I don't need answered now, but I'd like to know like what's inside the building besides the ducts? How many bathrooms? How many floors? How much room? Do we have a community room? Is there a place like the people can go at any time? Um, you know, um, like what's going on inside the building? Because I don't have any idea. But I don't need to know that now because it's really too late. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, Alex and Louis, did you want to respond to um, her comments about the, the water? And I would add, I would like to know where the water is going now, um, since the building is already in place, presumably and the sprinkler system is not. So where is the, the water being directed to now? The sewer. To the sewer? Yeah, it's, I, it's currently connected to the sewer. That's correct. Do you have any idea of approximate flow, um, like how what the actual volume is? We just, you know, talked about removing a lot of water from the sewer uh, in order to daylight uh, the lake. So it, it seems ironic we start putting a lot of it back. Uh, I defer to DEP and, and EDC on on the actual quantities. Um, and the actual, I'll have to get back to you on the actual flow. On I do know that it's supposedly gallons upon gallons oh. have been stored in one of the in this current cells that are on the roof that will be flowing into this project but so that i'm not sure what the current flow rate is i'll have to get okay. back to you on that i appreciate it because water is coming from underground um and then i believe dan you've been waiting patiently oh, thanks deb um yeah. just a, a couple of questions i know you're here i guess to to talk about or, or seek comments rather on the short-term RFP for the concession. Is there, a, is there a draft RFP that you guys have put out? We do not share is draft there? RFPs. As, as I mentioned earlier, we, um, as a policy, the agency does not send out draft RFPs to the public. Because you'd rather people not know what others are thinking to propose? That's not the case. We when we issue the RFP, that's when that's when others propose their ideas. But in 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 order to preserve the competitive nature of an RFP, um, the 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 scope of the RFP is shared once the RFP is issued. So the purpose of our of our meeting here today is to is to engage with the community and to understand what your ideas on the scope of this RFP should be. Understood. And are there any ideas that the agency wants to share that you want to comment on or no? Not at this time. Not at this time. Okay. Are there specific concessions? Because obviously there's going to be construction going on for some time to complete the project. Are there going to be limited concessions that will be open that you're seeking this short-term this short-term concession or RFP in, that in we would short, be able to? In the short term, what we'd be generally generally seeking is to continue the operations as is. Um, while while DDC's capital projects is is completed, and I can think in the, us... in, in the longer term RFP, that's when we can engage in more substantial uh, conversations so, about it. So, for purposes of tonight, what are the current operations that you're seeking comment on? What are the current operations that you're you're willing to uh, I guess rent out or for? Well, well, it's it's, RFP the, for? it's 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 the current golf course operations, and so are there any comments that the community board has? Do you have any feedback on the hours? Do you have any feedback on the pricing? Do you have any feedback on what the capital scope should include in the short-term RFP? So the, the, really the feedback should be coming from you. And then, and then we'll take that back to our leadership and, and for, for consideration and in including and, in, that, in that future RFP. And the current operations that we're talking about really aren't this building at all. That's correct. Okay, so while we're seeing what the design of the future building is, what you really wanna talk about is I guess the temporary golf concessionaire correct and and are you seeking are, are you asking us for what the term should be are you is that what the purpose of tonight is if you should have the term if, be one if year the, should the if, term if, if should the there be different services is, is that correct so then you have another hand up from David gotcha. in the room and just my one last question is this obviously there's a lot of questions about design and I guess that's not the purpose of tonight's meeting. So, you know, to the respective chairs, I would ask that we, we, you know, perhaps we can get on a calendar, you know, another meeting to discuss, you know, more design 
where, where the meeting is focused on the design part of it. And then I guess for parks, DDC, et cetera, have you guys, you know, presented this to the, the Croton Filtration Monitoring Committee? Or when is the last time that you guys did that? January. Yeah, this of was this presented year. in January. In January. Right. Right. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ex with the, ex with yeah, the exception of the update yeah. that he just provided. Um, Camille, you said there was someone in the room with us. Uh, and uh, thank yes, you, Dan, for those David, questions. Yes. Okay, one David. Question, Alexander, or one of your peers, do you happen to know approximately how many uh, golfers use the current driving range? Roughly, very roughly. We can, per, we, we, per uh, month, per year, per year. We can, we can provide, we can provide, and as a follow-up, we can provide you with um, the approximate number of rounds that are played per year. Oh, well, not rounds, I'm talking about the driving range. I, I don't, I don't believe any of our golf courses keep track of, of how many golfers come. And I, I don't know if there's a mechanism to track that information, but um, to the extent that they, that the, our concessionaire shares that information with us, we can provide that information. But um, the the required reporting is is number of rounds that are played, um, the total gross receipts that the uh, that the concession generates. Okay, it'd be useful if you got both of those figures for us. Thank you. Um, so thank you for for this presentation and for kind of clarifying the short term and the long term. I think um, the the in terms of capital requests, and oftentimes the beginning of a new concession agreement has uh, it, they're often front loaded a little bit with like um, requests um, for repairs. And I know that the golf fencing in general, um, when we spoke about the Van Cortlandt Golf House or Van Cortlandt Golf Course, we talked about a holistic approach to fencing. I think probably. That would be something we would want to look at here as well is just holistically does the fencing make sense, particularly um, as there's, I think there've been some uh, slight edits to the way the uh, golf course is configured. And so any opportunity to gain more parkland that's not connected to the golf course, I think would be, would be appreciated. I think there's also been a lot of concern about just in general, how this structure that you're presenting here, the, the, with the mode and the, that all of that, what happens at midnight or two o'clock in the morning? Um, you know, it, it, the presentation, I haven't seen any presentations that have indicated that there's any picket fencing to prevent folks from, or, you know, just gated access someplace to prevent folks from getting up onto this, um, this level at night. Um, do you, has there been any discussion about how it's going to be secured? I mean, I could just very easily see kids playing in this mode um you know uh, and it's got to be I assume dangerous to do something like that so in our rfps we don't prescribe uh you know uh, a specific you know re required uh security plan um, because part of the evaluation criteria is how they plan to operate the golf course how they plan to maintain the golf course how they plan to secure the golf course um and i think to to the earlier point about the fencing um, you know, bear in mind that this, you know, what we're talking about is a shorter term RFP. And so what, what, a, what a business, you know, that operates a concession is going to consider is return on investment. And so if we're talking about a, a very short term RFP, um, I think we need to be, um, you know, collectively, both parks and with the community board, realistic in terms of what we expect a concessionaire to be able to provide in terms of replacement fencing for a, a potential one year term or, or two year term. Um, uh, you know, while they're while they're trying to cover all the other expenses that they go along with maintaining this type of facility, so we're, we want to work with you to identify you know some of those areas. I think perhaps um, what I what I mentioned earlier was you know with the forthcoming RFP, you know after this short term one, a long term RFP, that would probably be a, a, a you know the, the best time to talk about a more robust um, and comprehensive plan to address the fencing. But but totally defer to you. I don't you know I don't want to you know hijack this this meeting to talk about fencing but 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 it's up to you it's up to you to 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 let me know well no i would just i mean maybe it's both right that um that the the, the rfp would require some kind of um like that I, I understand you're asking them how they're going to secure it but that as there's going to be a process where this structure is done and it's going to need to be it's going to be transferred over to parks and it would be i think it would make a, us feel a lot better to know that it's secured um, uh, even if it's not 
completely moved into yet because the new RFP hasn't, you know, the new um, concession agreement hasn't started, you know, that it's been that interim period before this becomes part of the new concession agreement that it's secured. And then that there's a long-term plan also for securing it. Totally, totally yes, understood. Know David raised his hand in the room and I think Ben and Karen, maybe this the old hand, but uh, no, I don't no, know if no, they are not. No. Oh, Karen, down. do you have a new hand? Oh, new hand yes. from Karen. Okay. Yes. So okay. You have Karen Ray and then David. And Karen. I think we should start talking about the um, inter the interim um, temp, whatever he's calling it. And yeah, the, the short term, I mean, does the term, committee. Uh, and I would like to make a suggestion on yeah. one of the things that I um, would like to offer is that I understand that everything is raised in prices, but you know, this is uh, one of the poorest areas, the Bronx, in the in the city. And whatever happens, we should not raise the rates that people pay to play golf, or go to the putting range, or go to the first tee, or whatever. Um, and so I would ask that the um, the cost of playing the game remain the same. Okay. Understood. So, and, and, and I will say, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll note that down. Um, you know, one thing, one, one thing that I think is interesting here is that you, the, the, the current operators here at this meeting. So the, 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 the comments that you, you've all made about the fencing, the comments you've made about the pricing, something to consider, Matt. Then you um, have here David and then Robert Panuzzi too. Okay. Then David and then Bob Panuzzi. Very quickly, uh, Deb, your point is well taken. Um, as the actual owner of the property, Parks, Dan, would you like to explain to uh, them the, uh, the, uh, the, the liability exposure of an attractive nuisance? It's a rhetorical question. Don't worry about it. Uh, Huge. Uh, uh, thank you, David. Duly noted. Um, uh, Bob Panuzzi? Um, does the current concession have connections or responsibility for educational engagement and community based organization engagement? How are young people brought in? Is that part of the scope of work of the concession? Can you speak up, Bob? We can't hear you. I'm sorry. I just want to know about the obligations in the contract, current and uh, proposed, short term uh, proposed for. Um, coordinating with schools and community-based organizations to get kids there. And um, the cells were always intended as ecology, educa uh, ecology education. Will there be additional um, provisions in the concession for education about the purpose of the cells? That was envisioned in the original presentation that I received at the Croton Filtration Monitoring Committee in 2014. So, you know, in, in, as is the case for all of our concessions, especially golf concessions, um, we encourage proposers to include any plans they may have um, for community outreach, plans to work with local schools, um, to grow the game, because um, actually, you know, it, it's, it's, it's important for an operator to be able to do outreach to um, younger players, because those are going to be the future players that use these facilities. And so um, in, in this particular case, um, you know, I, I think first tee is probably, um, you know, best position to talk about uh, the, the, the work that they've done over the years in terms of community outreach and work with local schools. But we can certainly follow up um, to this meeting with, with more specifics and what the license requires, but in the interest of time and, and, and because we're all here, uh, perhaps uh, reps from first tee can talk about the, the work that they've done. I actually rather I'd rather address that to Parks as for future um, because okay. you guys are the ones writing it. Um, and I would like you to take back uh, from the original language in this proposal for the ecological uh, function of these um, cells and that they should be part of the concessionaire's um, uh, contract to provide insight and education about why this water body is there. That was so, um, the so Bob, well, we can we can take that as a note for um, when we have the conversation about the larger um, long term one because I don't it won't be part of this particular training because they won't or this particular okay. concession agreement because it's just going to be for the next year or two. 
what, what, what would be help? What would be helpful? Well, Weiler, to, yeah, if you can take that back and, and explore it further, thank you. Sure. What would be yeah. helpful at, at the conclusion of this meeting is if um, we could get something in writing from CB8 um, addressing some of the, the the ideas and the suggestions, both short and long term. Because I don't want to say that we're not going to consider anything long term. We'll we'll take your comments and your feedback anytime um, for both this upcoming RFP and for the future RFP. So we're not going to forget about it. Um, to the extent that you have those ideas now, please share them with us as soon as you can. Um, we'll discuss that with our leadership, my supervisor, our first deputy commissioner, Iris Rodriguez Rosa, and obviously our commissioner, uh, Sue Donahue. Thank you so much. That was Alex who was speaking, right? Yes. Yes. So then just to, uh, is there anybody new, else? A new hand from Dan. A new hand from Dan? New hand from Dan. Yeah. Uh, Dan, you want to go? Yeah, just very too quick for the concessionaire. Um, just two quick ideas, things that are great on a golf course, like in local, any reduced rate for packages are, are phenomenal. If you could buy, like, say, in advance for, you know, four outings at, at a reduced rate, anything like that, um, and for city residents, and then just ease of use on the website. That's always, you know, very helpful as well for all concessionaires uh, to make sure that it's easy for the public to get on, get a tea time, you know, figure out all of the, you know, the information. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. So um, can we uh, stop uh, stop sharing for a moment? Just so we can see the committee. I think that's Lewis, right? Okay. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, just to, to um, wrap this piece of it up, um, I think what I'm hearing from the committee is that uh, as follow up that I can send, I should send a letter um, requesting um, that costs remain the same that uh, to and encouraging affordability and the holistic approach to fencing, securing the golf house, and that we think that um, DEP should really own the administration of the moat because we have concerns about the amount of water and the complexity of it. Is that the, does that sum, summarize it? Yes, sounds good. Not quite that, that there, there should be adequate and accurate language about the operation of the, um, uh, the cells included in the concession that reflects the, um, the, the uh, role of the filtration plant itself. So that you can, that, that goes back to your insight and education on the, the, on the moat. So it's really insight and education that's on the, the filtration that, plant. That's a, secondary, a second point is that the concession should include both outreach to schools, local organizations, but also education about why the moat is there for the general public. That's different than the operation it is a indispensable feature of the of the golf course, and therefore should be part of the um, in, in the uh, user engagement with the golf course. Okay. All right. And then um, I want to just while we still have the concessionaires, folks, um, the, the we wanted to just talk a little bit about the stables, which is the other RFP that's coming up. Um, is do, do you have anything you'd like to share with us about how the RFP? about that RFP? So the current agreement expires in September of 2024. We have not issued a, a formal notice to CB8 regarding that, that pending RFP. But I understand that you know, with, the, with the summer months coming that, that many community boards um, have a recess and, and but we do not wanna you know, um, you know, not give you time to provide any comments or thoughts that you may have. We have, um, only begun started, you know, to, to, to look into that forthcoming RFP. We don't have a term in mind as of yet. Um, and we have not developed the capital scope because frankly, we need to go out there. And, and this is great to have Tony and, and Lindsay both here because um, Tony, as, as, as the, the, you know, the chief person here who would, who would evaluate what the capital needs of and, and the scope of, of capital improvements for that RFP would be, um, this would be a good opportunity to hear from you all um, what your thoughts are um, in terms of just the general upkeep, um, the improvements that have been made to the facility, uh, but even beyond that, if you if you have any thoughts on general day to day operations, hours, prices, services that are offered, um, you know we, we're happy to hear about those from you now. Or you know if you want to send us something in writing later on, that's that's perfectly fine too. Is there any? I'll open up to the committee first. Is there anybody who has any um, experience they'd like to discuss about the? Um, the stables. Uh, Karen. Karen has a hand up. Yeah, oh, Karen, you want to go? 
Oh yeah, so I I mean I would love to like review it, but I I'm very happy with the stables. I think they are an extremely well uh, organized. The place is clean. They are an asset to the park and to the community. Um, and I think they're doing a really great job. I mean, I haven't been there in a couple of years, but um, every time I pass by, I can see that they're still clean and neat. They do a lot of good stuff. They they do some heavy duty recycling of uh, product and they're just doing an excellent job. Um, I, would, I would push back on that a little bit, Karen. That's not my, entirely my experience with the stables. Um, I, I, they are very, like they do, the stables themselves as a facility operationally are run, they seem to be run well, that the building is maintained, the, um, you can move through it, there's no litter, the, the, everything is very, like the, the, the grounds are all kept very well. But I would say that as a person who lives in the neighborhood, who, you know, goes by there, like that, um, I, I have never ridden a horse there. I don't, there's not, not, it's not easy public access. You can't, there's no real public outreach. There's no real public programming. It's not easy for a person who lives in the neighborhood to engage. And that essentially seems to be boarding the horses of folks who live in Westchester and, um, and, and doesn't really, the, the current stable owners, as far as I understand it, like my experience with them, I don't get the impression that they're, um, that there's a, a, a local purpose for them um, as a public facility. That I mean, that, you know, there's a lot of folks in, you know, that have horses that they're boarding there that I'm just not really aware of. I mean, I would love, you know, maybe that's something we could, you know, just explore more in like September, October. I don't, when's the, when do you need, um, when do you, will the call for comments come back? Um, uh, when do you need us to comment for the stables for that RFP? Can we like meet maybe in September or October and then get back to you? We can meet with you anytime. Um, you know, there there is a process which Parks does not control. The, the city's concession rules are what every city agency need, needs to follow right. in terms of awarding a concession. Um, they're never as quick as we'd like them, the process to be. I mean, this is a bureaucratic process. Um, right. That being said, um, I will say that the Parks Department does the lion's share of concessions um, um, out of any city agency. You know, over 90% of the city's concessions are operated by, by Parks concessionaires. Um, and that is because, you know, roughly 15 to 20% of, of city, city land is, is park land at, to begin with. Um, we, we are, you know, we always encourage our concessionaires um, to do community outreach. And um, in addition to the boarding of the horses that they do uh, at, at, at the Sables in Van Cortland, um, they do have a very robust therapeutic riding program, which was curbed, you know, admittedly as a result of the pandemic when, when folks couldn't engage in activities like that because we couldn't be around each other. Um, right. but, that, but that being said, you know, prior to the pandemic, they had a very successful therapeutic riding program. And that's something that we'd like to continue. Um, they do have... Um, they do have services uh, for for um, um, for writing for the general public. Um, I I I would agree I would agree with you, Deborah, that um, you know there's always an opportunity to do, to do more and to do more outreach, and we don't have to wait until the next RFP. We can talk to the current concessionaire um, with the time that they have left to do more uh, outreach to the local community and to engage with the community board um, if that's what you um, would like. If if there are other, you know. Um, you know, through social media or any other types of engagement opportunities that you would suggest, um, please tell us about that because you know you know that better than we do, and we'd love to to work with you um, to suggest ways that the concessionaire can work and 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 provide outreach and and make the local community aware of of the of the other services that they provide, and I'm and I'm sure that they'd be willing to do that um, if it's feasible for them. Yeah, no, I think that all sounds great. I, 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 uh, is there another? Oh, is there another question? And uh, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, Bob, yes, okay. Yeah. Alex, pony rides. Pony rides for the community. We've done previous concessions. Yes. The tradition in Bay Coral Park. Yes, Free pony rides. Take that back, please. Free pony rides. You know, we can we can certainly make us we can certainly make that ask. Um, you know, it's been done. the previous concessionaire did yeah. it was a civic celebration. 
the concession host that brought everybody to the park. It's very simple. Yes. You get customers that way. I'm sorry, Understood. I'm jumping in quickly to back to Anuzi. My children were first time they touched the horse at that concession. I don't know which concessionaire, but there at the stables, it was two free events, one in spring, one in the fall. Uh, they should come back if possible. <laughs> Understood. Right. Community district tradition. Anybody working here should follow. Okay. All right, Julie noted. I, mean, I think what we should do is we should, um, we should, um, you know, and because it's late and you guys have you've been really great, but I know we all want, have to get to bed, that um, uh, we're going to go, we'll be going on a break in July, August, but we'll be back in September and then maybe we can. Sure start to uh, like have a real a real meeting that where we talk to the stables folks and learn more about their programming and what they're doing and um and we can also just take the summer to try to ride a, ride a horse if that's a possible thing um and, and uh and see how that goes um, okay. and then i had one last uh question which is about the food trucks i saw that we got the list of um of concessions uh, the annual list of concessions in the Bronx and included um, some like two or three food trucks in our in our district, one at Fort Independence Park and one in Seton Park. There were new concessions. Um, is this a new program? Um, are, are these park going to be parked in the parks? Um, what can you tell us a little bit more about them? So um, so our annual concession plan is a wish list of, of concessions that, that we want to activate. It's it's not a new program. Actually, the, the, the food truck at Seton, uh, Seton Park um, we've had a permit there for many years. Um, the hmm. prior the prior agreement expired at the end of last year. Um, my understanding is that the 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 prior operator uh, did not operate for the last couple of years due to the pandemic. Um, however, there we have historically had uh, a truck outside of the park. Um, unfortunately, we 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 you know through the last RFP for for seeking bids for these two locations, we did not receive any responses. Um, and so uh, we will not have any permits um, for this year, but we'll we'll try again in in 2024. So when do the when do you when does the window open up for RFPs for these because for these processes? We try to issue for RFBs. We try to issue our RFBs um, in the second half of the calendar year, and that'll be for permits that will begin January one of the following can, calendar year. So if we assuming we do receive bids. For these locations those permits will begin january 1 2024 and the permits will be a five-year term five-year term and then so then next fall is when those rfps would be going out ideally yes but unfortunately it's it, it is not a unilateral thing we need we do need approval from the mayor's office of contract services and the city's law department in order to issue any solicitation so assuming we get there we get the approval done um, we would seek to issue that RFB in the fall. But um, anyone who is interested in operating a concession, whether it be a food cart, a stable, a golf course, a restaurant, a marina, ice rink, tennis bubble, I'm just trying to go through it, you know, right. Christmas tree stand, whatever it may be, we maintain, right. we maintain separate mailing lists for each of these concession types. We advertise them in local papers. We, we work with SBS and EDC um, to get the word out. Because what we want is as many responses as we as we possibly can, um, and um, we encourage folks to reach out to us if they want to join our mailing list for these types of opportunities. And then anytime we issue a solicitation for the types of concession they're interested in in the future, we will send them an email um, that this opportunity is out there, and we'll give them instructions on how to download it and see what the list of locations are. Right. So, um, but so does that mean then that you may not or likely won't um, have a RFP for concessions in these two parks? We will issue the RFP for these two parks, but I can't promise that we'll we'll have we'll get any responses. Not people to right that'll right. be adequate. And right. Got it. Okay. And then why not Van Cortland Park? We do have permits in Van Cortland Park um, as well, and we've we've had like three or four historically. Um, I think the last time around, unfortunately, we we also did not receive responses, and it, it may be as a result of the pandemic that that you know some folks just don't think that the you know there's enough profits out there. Um, we have seen a lot of folks coming to the parks during COVID. Um, however, there has been a proliferation of illegal vendors, um, yeah. which is really a cat and mouse game um, because we we can send our parks enforcement out there to a given location. 
and they may get a summons, but they'll just come back literally later the same day, if not the next yeah. day. Um, so, so it is a constant challenge for us. Um, our enforcement folks do a really good job, um, but part of it is really just getting the word out. Um, and, and we do need help from, from any of our, you know, uh, local community boards and, and other stakeholders to let folks know that these opportunities out there, you know, in, the, in, the, in terms of mobile foods, we have literally hundreds of locations we put out for bid in all five boroughs every year. And many of those locations do not receive a single response. So, and then I have one last question, which is the tennis pro in Seton Park. I know that that's up for renewal or for yes. a new RFP. Um, directly beside that tennis court, there is a um, there's a, a stand. Uh, like, is that considered a, a food stand, or is that part of this concession at all, or is it something else? When you say stand, what do you what do you mean? I'm, I'm... There's like a little like a, it could be a, a a snack stand, or maybe it was a ticket stand at some point. There's this building that's attached to the tennis court right there that's um, boarded up, it, it seems like it could be used for something, I, but I wasn't sure if it was part of this concession. It is not. The, the tennis instructors in, in all of our parks, and we have them in all five boroughs, um, yeah. they do not come with any infrastructure. And so what, what, they're, giving a per, what they're given a permit for is, is really the privilege of teaching tennis on one court um, Got it. For, the, for that term, for, during the okay. tennis season, which is roughly from April through November each year. Got it, okay. All right, any other last questions? All right, I think we've exhausted the topic. I wanna to thank you guys so much for coming and staying on, it was very late. So I know we owe you drinks if we run into you um, in the street someplace um, or at a concession of your choice. Um, so um, to thank you so much for, for coming and answering all of our questions. And um, I look forward to like uh, trying to give you some good substantive feedback in the fall um, on the staples, which I guess well, that'll be our next one. Great. That, that'd be great. And, and look, we can meet, we can meet virtually. If you want to meet at the stables, we can do that too. Okay. All right. That sounds good. And then we'll okay. get a letter out to you with our recommendations for the short term, um, which you've already heard tonight, but just to formalize it. Understood. Thank you so much. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Good night. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. All right, Camelia, I'm turning it back over to you now to um, do your chair's report. Are you are you frozen? No, oh, there you are. Excuse me. Hello. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. Just uh, thank you all. Um, this has been a heavy duty meeting. Therefore, uh, I will try to wrap it up by by ten. Uh, I will do the chair report, all business, new business, all in one. As far as chair report, um, I just want to flag the email that I sent probably two or three days ago, which uh, referred to the new open restaurants program, uh, a new bill introduced in the council, and how it will go back to DOT and the implication that has in terms of sanitation. There is, they definitely move forward with uh, the requirement for containerization of trash coming from restaurants in a continued effort to prevent the direct uh, population. And as those things advance, we will, uh, I guess, receive more information from DSNY, post it, and, and make it available to the community. And then my sort of final open question to the committee members for ENS is if you do see a need for a June uh, meeting, as far as I'm concerned, uh, sort of a follow-up point was a communication that we had shooting over to our elected and MTA as far as making possible for us a little tour informal of ENS and, uh, and elected so that we kind of understand the situation on the ground on the MTA property. But I don't know if this necessarily requires a, meet, a proper formal meeting or we can just organize it as a you know, walkthrough essentially. What do you people, what do my members think? Triangle, the, triangle Dubai, the famous, Dubai, the Bermuda Dubai, Triangle. Yeah. Yes. Let's hear from Yenes. Let's hear from Yenes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't think of anything. Uh, anything I don't think of anything that is requiring a, a meeting. If then we want you're to muted, do a, I think. So, no, or we can't hear you. No. Okay. Can you not hear me? I can. We hear still you. can't you hear you. Not muted. Something on I, your I'm not muted. Right. I, I would no, she's not muted. muted. Oh, okay, now you're good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I was just saying, I don't, I don't think there's anything that requires a, a meeting. It sounds like it could be a walkthrough. 
I mean, if the board, if the I, community I, board wants to take a, if the community I board wants to take, because I have three people speaking at the same time. We don't understand anything. Deb, we didn't hear the beginning of what you said. You want meeting or no meeting or prepare no meeting. Walk through, basically. No, no meeting. meeting walk through. Walk through. Okay. okay. Meeting. No. Good. Karen. <laughs> Well, the problem is if you want to make a resolution that the community board has a position about the land that we didn't yeah. get, we got to have a meeting. But we will not have time for that, Karen. The resolution that will be in full board in June is the resolution we passed today. Well, the no, that's not true, Camelia. The, the board oh, meeting right, is on right, right, June right. 29th. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Absolutely right. Yeah. So we could do, if know. we met, we could make another but, resolution for the MTA property from 230 to yeah. 225. What I would, however, uh, say is that we tried a softer approach. And even with Laura, we discussed having a communication first, meaning a letter of some sort, asking for the walkthrough and so that we can go there and get some sort of feedback and, and have our own thinking clear before we move forward. I think there's plenty time to ask for this in the next year, uh, but uh, whatever you guys want. I'll, I'll support that, that approach. And, okay. and, and encouraging Laura to write a letter to, DEP, uh, to MTA. Yeah. Laura created the first appearance of Andrew at the last meeting and that um, Laura would ask for a walkthrough and uh, depending on what the result of that letter was, we would plan a meeting. No, the letter has to come from the committee. It can't come from Laura. I mean, somebody has to be No, 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 no. Karen, we already join letters what, on what, this. Yeah. yeah. So um, what I'm oh. saying is that Laura, Camelia should both yes. write a letter, invite them to the walkthrough. Yes. Oh, and yeah. Oh, OK. Right. That letter, yes. we'll decide about yes. the joint, the, the meeting in, in June. All right. right. Excellent. Sounds good. OK, Thank I will you. follow up on this. And uh, any other questions, or I can wrap up ENS and pass it over to Deb to sort of wrap up on her end. Any other questions from members? No, no. cool. Okay, great. And maybe you I should refer wanna... it to the DOT, the Tra Traffic and Transportation Committee. The only thing I worry about is that the 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 TNT doesn't have a, ch a chair because um, Kelly is on her way out, um, and that there's I don't think anyone's put their uh, yeah, right. hat in the ring yet for that committee. Oh, okay. um, so there's a that would be more uncertain. I as parks, um, the parks committee could also, I think, um, own a greenway, um, frankly, since it'll be an extension of the Putnam, which will be a, a linear park. And any greenway no, would no, also I be understand a it's a park, but what I'm saying is the issue is, is on the is the MTA, yeah, it's true, right? But and let's, convene, let's take the step and let's secure a date, and then we invite everybody that you know is related yeah. to the topic including tnt and we take it from you're there. not gonna they're not gonna give you a tour and they're not gonna give you a date okay let's well, try through the Alexis and then we yeah, do what we can do yeah okay okay so to be followed i will update everybody uh, where i'm get, going with, with with laura on 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 this and uh if no other issues i'm closing this and passing it over to them for for her piece so the thank you, Camelia, for that. Um, so the parks chair's report. I just have um, a reminder that, um, that we're still in the budget process, and that um, New Yorkers for Parks is doing just amazing work trying to raise awareness of how underfunded the parks department is. Um, they get less than one half a percent, um, and that you know when you look around you and you see parks that have high grass, or you look around you and you see people violating parks rules left, right, and center. Um, 95% of that to 100% of that is because there's not enough money for the parks department. Right. And so, um, you know, if you see a park that is very well maintained with very complex plantings and mulch and stuff, and it's not Van Cortland Park, it's because there's a stewards group that is 100% volunteers that's taking care of that park. Mm -hmm. And so the parks department has to rely on volunteers in order to do some basic maintenance. And that's just not, that's not right. And um, we owe our parks a lot more. They're very valuable to us emotionally. And so I just encourage you to support um, just getting more parks funding. Um, uh, and so New York Institute Parks is working to get them 1%. So check out their website. There, there's a big hearing next week on the budget. And there's a lot of organization going on around that. Um, so that's my my chair's report. Uh, is there any old business? Any new business? Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Or I got adjourn. one there, David. David, you trying to do it twice? I see two fingers. 
Um, do I have a second? No, 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 no. I, before we adjourn. Oh, you know, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you were doubling down on adjourning. Uh, you, do you have a question? No. I just wanted to say thank you for to, to uh, Amelia for organizing this joint meeting because I'm yeah. confident that next month the mayor is not going to or and the governor whatever are not going to renew the the uh, hybrid uh, the um, uh, you know the remote stuff. So by the fall. This meeting is going to be what we're going to be doing, and this is a good proof of concept. Because I think we will have we will have the meetings primarily here, and we will have lots of people calling in. I anticipate that's the the paradigm for hybrid come September. All so right. Thank you for. Uh, yeah, no, I, I totally want to. I, I support you. I'm glad you said something, David. It, uh, Camelia, the whole year has been doing all of her meetings, both virtually <laughs> and in person. And you know that's really what the best model is because it allows people to attend remotely who can't otherwise because of personal issues or just like me, they're not in the city right now. Um, and then also be in person, which I think is actually going to be very good for us as a board because it reminds us of actual relationships and allows us to make friendships with each other, which is um, a big way to prevent kind of toxic behavior, right? It's just to have people across the table that you're negotiating with. So I think it's gonna be a really good thing to get us all back into the same room with each other. So thank you for calling that yeah, out, that David. We won't have the cross wires of people, of board members or committee members being away. They'll all be here. And so it'll just be calling on community members. You guys, yeah. you are very kind. I really appreciate the kind words and just the support throughout from everyone. And if we don't get to meet, just want to say special thanks to Rofa Nuzi who passed me, you know, the chairmanship, but was supportive throughout. Never a single time, like, questioned me or undermined me. I felt it all along. Thank you, Karen, Deb, all of you. Rashida, thank you for being there. I need you for quorum all the time. And just thanking all of you. Uh, I don't know if we did a motion to adjourn or where we are with that, but let's do it. Karen, since I saw your hat. My hat? <laughs> no, I saw your hat. So no, I assume you're a Met fan. She's a Met oh, fan. Oh, definitely Met oh. fan. Right, right. <laughs> this is a 9-11 Met uh, <laughs> NYPD FTNY hat. All right. I need to do like two little things to close. So somebody kindly make a so motion do, so that I can stop adjourn. recording. Uh, so All move. right. Second. Anybody again? No. I know. All right. Anybody good night. Abstaining? Good night. No. I do good thank everybody. you all and have a good okay. night. Good night. Okay. Bye. <laughs>